Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. The show originally aired on the Premier Network on Saturday, March 10th, 2018. This is episode 1469. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Wink. The best way to discover new wines you love. I love Wink. You will too. But you've got to go to trywink.com slash techguy and you get $20 off your first shipment. T-R-Y-W-I-N-C dot com slash techguy. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Yes, it's time. Time to talk technology, computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, virtual reality, augmented reality, Real Reality, 8888-ASK-LEO is my phone number, 888-827-5536. When I say talk, I mean talk with you. Can't do it without you. So uh, get those phones ringing. Kim Schaffer's here to answer them. She's going to pick up your line and paste down your calyx, put a little powder on your nose, get you ready for your big appearance on national radio, 888-827-5536. 5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, you can still uh, call the show. You just uh, use Skype out. That'll work. 8888-ASK-LEO. I was uh, just, just came back from Austin, Texas over the last few days. We went down for a big uh, Woodstock for Nerds festival. It's called South by Southwest. And they do three different festivals. The first of them which is on right now, Friday through Monday, is called the Interactive Festival. That's where the real geeks show up. And then they do South by Southwest film and music. So they have a music festival and they have a film festival. And uh, Steven Spielberg's down there because he's got something that crosses all of those boundaries. He's got a new movie coming out at the end of the month called Ready Player One that is based on a science fiction book that, that, that we geeks cherish almost above all others. What's interesting about it, it's it's about the future, about a young man, of course, right, because that's how you get the nerds interested. It's about me, uh, who really lives in a world where virtual reality is king. And uh, the world, the real world itself is kind of messed up. Sound familiar? And he puts on <laughs> these headsets, as do many, and enters this amazing world where uh, anything is possible and people get together and it's going to be a, it's going to be I think a very interesting a science fiction movie but the Spielberg's down there to 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 show it they have a they're going to it's funny how they everybody knows there's going to be a screening but no one knows where and everybody's like, where do you, do you know where it is do you know where it is it's somewhere down there and they have a big virtual reality uh experience they call it they take they this is one of the things that the uh, South by Southwest has really become a marketing <laughs> exposition, frankly, and as as has the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. And so they took over a building, like a giant building, and upstairs they've got a virtual reality experience with like beat up old trailers and stuff. And you go in there, and it's a, it's right out of the movie, and you put on virtual reality headsets and you wander around. And then downstairs they have kind of an '80s themed dance arcade thing because the movie even though it takes place in the future, is very nostalgic about the 80s. Oh, another smart move. Ernest Klein knew what he was doing when he wrote that, wrote that novel. So it'll, it, it'll be interesting uh, to see how that movie uh, goes over. There's, that's not the only thing that was going on at South by Southwest. HBO took over several acres of land out of town. I guess in Texas there, is, there are plenty of places to do that. And he built a Westworld. They built a Westworld. And uh, they put tickets online, and they sold out in two minutes. So that was the other buzz down there was, did you get Westworld tickets? No. And you have to sign a release that says all sorts of things, like, you know, you could die. You do, you, you won't hold the HBO responsible for the loss of any limbs, that kind of thing, which I'm sure is a joke, right? <clears throat> I'm, sure it's, I'm sure it's a joke. Uh, didn't get a chance to do that either, but... I tried to get to the Ready Player One thing, but, I, you know, it's, it's kind of like Disneyland. There's a long line to get in. You have to sign all these waivers and all this stuff. 
And then, uh, so we waited like an hour to get into that part. And then you get in, and then they say, oh, it's another two hours to go through the VR experience. Forget it. And we had to go home. I went home. So that's where all the, all the geeks are, if you're wondering where they are today. They're in Austin, Texas. That's South by Southwest. Science Magazine study came out this week talking about fake news. <laughs> They did a big analysis of uh, 4.5 million tweets and retweets from 2006 through 2017. And what they found probably won't surprise anybody. Fake news, a.k.a. inaccurate news stories, spread faster and further than true stories. That, in fact, if you want to get a lot of retweets, tweet something outrageous and false. And then it'll spread. Retweet train. Tweet, <laughs> I can't say it. Retweet chains. You try it. Retweet chains discussing true news stories took longer on average to reach the same number of people of, as conversations about fake news. True news also would like max out. After about 1,600 people just died. <laughs> it's like, eh. It's true. Who cares? But. False stories, almost 47,000 users compared to the 1,600. But is this a surprise? Is it really? I mean, this is what, uh, this is, uh, because f uh, fake news stories are really often uh, created to grab your attention, to feel true, right? And yet at the same time to be outrageous. Oh, I can't believe it. And then, but of course you believe it, right? Yeah, but of course it's true. I can't believe it. But of course it's true. And they spread like crazy. And that's really, if you ask me uh, what Twitter is all about, there been a, there's been lately <clears throat> a spate of articles and stories by people who are giving up Twitter and Facebook and saying, take social media off your phone. It's the latest thing. Take social, I did it a few weeks ago. Take social media off your phone. It's just a time sink. It's wasting your time. <clears throat> I'm going to guess most of you don't do Twitter. Most of you do do Facebook. That's kind of what the stats are. In fact, seven, I think the last we talked about it last week, but I think it was 76 percent of all American adults are on Facebook pretty regularly. Twitter's more of a specialty product, but it's really an outrage engine. <laughs> Here's some outrage. You'll see this today on Twitter. Uh, one of the one of the uh, a, a guy I like a lot, Farhad Manju, who's a tech columnist, kind of the tech columnist for the New York Times, did a whole thing about how he gave up social media and digital news for two months and only read newspapers. A little self-serving, New York Times. Only read newspapers for two months, and how happy he was, how much happier. <laughs> then the Columbia Journalism Review pointed out that in those two months, Farhad tweeted over. As much as 16 times a day, over a thousand times, uh, and even retweeting news stories, he clearly was, he, he wasn't, <laughs> he didn't give up Twitter. Twitter's so hard to give you up. It is the heroine of a certain uh, group of people. It is really addictive for a certain group of people. And, and it's bad for you, just like any addictive drug. It's bad for you. Because uh, it's really, it's designed to spread, not just, I don't even want to say fake news, it's designed to spread outrage. And as somebody has pointed out, all outrages on Twitter are equal. Out, the, whether, it's, whether that dress is black and blue or gold and white is equal in, in every respect to, I don't know, something, you know, the, the, the fact that in Hawaii... It was announced there was going to be a ballistic missile attack, and it's not a drill. It was equal, even though, obviously, in the real world, those things are not equal. The color of a dress is not nearly as important as the fact that the citizens of Hawaii were put into a panic by a false alarm. And yet, on Twitter, it's all equal. It's all equal. It's all the same. It's indistinguishable. I don't know. I'm just... Uh... <laughs> I'm, I don't look at it much anymore, and I, I do notice. I'm not... My blood pressure is better. It affects your blood pressure. I'm Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are going to come back in a moment and start to, uh, focusing on your problems, your technology woes. Leo Laporte, 8888 Ask Leo. Give me a call.
Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888, ask Leo, Sharon, <laughs> you're my Sharon, Kim Schaffer. She uh. is answering the phones and helping us, and uh, we have, you've been here answering the phones for hours and hours, and you have come. <laughs> you beat me this morning. <laughs> I know, I came in early. I know. I was shocked. I'm on Austin started. time. That's why I'm oh, on Austin time. You're a couple hours early. Yeah. An hour early, a couple hours early. We have to set the clock forward we do tomorrow, today. don't we? Or to, yeah, well, I'll do it tonight. So we every okay. year this happens, and we, we always bemoan it, and uh, I always point out that when the clocks change, the Monday after the, the spring forward or fall back, either way, Mostly spring forward, though, because you lose an hour of sleep. There are more heart attacks. There are more car wrecks. People die because of daylight saving time. Stop the insanity. You know, the funny thing is they voted in Florida to stay on daylight saving time. Mm -hmm. And you can't. You're not allowed to. What? You can't. You can stay on daylight standard time, as parts of Arizona and Hawaii do, mm -hmm. because that's the official whatever, of the United <laughs> States. It's not a time zone because we have many, but it's uh, what it is. It's the official thing of the United States. We're in daylight st on standard time, standard time. But daylight saving time is a thing that you can say, I'm not going to do that. But nobody wants daylight, nobody wants standard time. We all want daylight saving time, right? Or am I wrong? I like the end result of what will happen tonight. I don't dark, like the lighter waking in the, up in the, the, the day. Yes, right. or, or, uh, after right. it's not dark at five o'clock in right. the evening anymore. But I do not like losing that hour. That that so losing it, the hour. It would, it, is, so the Florida legislator uh, legislature approved it. I think uh, Rick Scott's going to sign it. it. Doesn't matter because it's not up to them. So all the all the bill can do is say, "Hey, federal government, maybe you ought to think about changing it." Hmm. Um, seems unlikely. I don't yeah, think. I, I, I don't think Congress. Really I don't think I'll see it in my anything. lifetime. <laughs> yeah, but um, boy, I would like that. I hate the clock change. Don't yeah, you? Yeah. No, I just well, just let's just stick with one. One thing though, I am going to do. I always say I'm going to do it, but this time I'm going to do it. <clears throat> I'm going to get the ladder out and change the batteries in all my uh, smoke smoke detectors. smoke detectors. You're supposed to do that every time the time changes. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know the the deal is. I always do, I always figure, oh, I'm not going to. And then you want to do it because otherwise it's going to wake you up in the middle of the night oh, with, with that, that little beep? chirp. Yeah, the chirp the chirp drives me nuts. And then you're going to be sorry. You said, <laughs> oh, I should have done it at daylight saving time. So I'm going to do it tonight. I'm going to crawl all over the house because. You have a lot of them. I got a lot of them. <laughs> I got a lot of them. We're very safe in the Laporte house. So is there somebody on the line I can talk to to help me? <laughs> I don't know if they can help you, oh, but I think I'm there. you can oh, help them. So Penny's going to go oh. on a fun family vacation, but oh, she owns a business. Nice. And she needs to be able to stay in touch and wants to know, is that going to be possible on her cruise ship? Can she take her laptop? Will I am her an phone expert. work and all those fun I am things. an expert on all this. Yes, you are. Because I, I go you away do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Hello, Penny. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Good morning, Leo. How are you? I am wonderful. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. So I am going, I am taking my family on a cruise. We're going to Alaska. We're leaving oh. Los Angeles and we're going to Seattle, I think, and then to Canada and then on the cruise ship. But I need to take my laptop <clears throat> and my phone with me to stay in constant contact. So I can run my business even though I'm not in Los Angeles proper. This is why I need to we, take this is why we we small business owners never get vacations. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you did it though. That's great, Penny. And here's some here's some good news. Uh, the cruise ship probably does not have great internet. There's only one cruise line. Uh, that does have really good internet, and I've been on it. It's uh, it's the Royal Caribbean line. Who's what line are you on? We're going on the Princess. Princess cruises are so lovely. The Love Boat, but uh, unless they've upgraded now, of course they're all owned by the same few companies. But unless they've upgraded their internet, uh, chances are it's not going to be super fast because the way um, the internet works <clears throat> on these cruise ships, they use a big satellite dish and something called InMarsat that gets very, really little bandwidth. Plus, you've got how many people on that boat? Several thousand. And, right. And th so that if you have to use the internet and use the boat's internet, A, it's going to be a little pricey, and B, it's going to be very slow unless you get up in the middle of the night to do it. 
when everybody else on the boat is asleep. Okay. Uh -huh. However, because you're on an Alaska cruise, there is some good news. First of all, you're not, you, you, except for Vancouver, you're not leaving the U.S. So your right. cell phone will probably work whenever you're close enough. And in, in an Alaska cruise, you don't really, you're not out at sea that often. As long as you're close enough to land, you're, who's your carrier? Uh, Sprint. Sprint. Uh, you'll have to check what Sprint's coverage is. Okay. Uh, in in the areas you're going to, but you may be fine because as long as you can get your Sprint phone working and data on your Sprint phone, you can tie that your laptop to that, and and usually LTE data is pretty fast. So you'll want to check to see how fast Sprint is when you're in Canada. Uh, but that's only one day, right? I believe so. Yeah. When you're in Canada, it'll cost a lot. So you when you talk to Sprint or when you look at the Sprint site, you should also find out what it would cost to have one day of international data roaming uh-huh uh because that's going to be your best bet or you just say hey this is the day i'm going to be out of touch is it vital that you be in touch every single moment of the day or um well we're leaving on a saturday so saturday and sunday i don't need to but the, during the weekdays i need to be um in e constant e email contact. constant contact not e not just email you, you know well, email it's yeah emails emails not a little easier the problem is, and you should tell, warn your uh, your customers and your employees before you go, uh, that you will be able to receive email, but it may not be instant turnaround. And uh, you know, to send the send small emails, don't 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 send you big contracts or pictures or anything that's too big. But text goes uh -huh. pretty quick, and even on a cruise ship, you'll you'll, you'll be able to, to, especially if you set your computer to do it at four in the morning, download email. Here's what we often do. My wife's the CEO of our small company, so uh, here's what she does. She'll she'll get the email in the morning and tell people, I'll get back to you by the end of the day. She can respond to uh -huh. the email because, you know, if you have a good email program, you can respond. And then it'll slowly dribble it out <laughs> over the ship's Internet to the end of the day. The only exception to this, and I, have, I expect this is going to change, is Royal Caribbean. Uh, I was on the Anthem of the Seas a couple of years ago. They have something I think they call Vroom internet service that is remarkable it's about as fast as your home internet so if you need internet that's a good and but the thing is if they can do it why can't everybody do it i would imagine as ships get re, re, refitted that this will start spreading leo laporte the tech guy so you're going to have a great time and just tell your employees that i can't i um this is a vacation right they, yeah, I don't get a vacation. I know, I know. But just tell them, I, you know, I will promise you will hear from me within 24 hours, but I can't yeah. promise I'll give you one hour turnaround. How about that? Right. I'm not as concerned with the employees as I Customers. am. We work yeah. with regional centers, so I'm more concerned about getting back to the service coordinators at the different regional centers. Uh, when they send an email. And That's they're the kind concern. of people, if you don't respond within half an hour, will freak out? Probably, or email me again and say, hey, I emailed you a half an hour yeah. ago. What you know, yeah, that type so of they're gonna that's gonna be a problem now. Your most vacation emails, most email uh, services or servers have vacation settings where you can say, Look, I am paying attention to email, but I'm gonna be in and out of service in Alaska, so it, it may be that I take a little longer to respond than usual. Please be patient, but I will get back to you. Okay, I could set, I could do that setting. Yeah, have that setting. Now, you're going to want to do that at your server because that'll go out automatically from your server instantly. Okay. So do you use Gmail? What do you use? Um, I use Hotmail still. Hotmail. I think Hotmail check in the settings. Look at vacation settings, they call them. Okay. And then that way, Hotmail, you know, you don't even, before you even get your mail, Hotmail will say, look, uh, I'm on vac. It'll be in your name and all that. I'm on vacation, but I, I, I do care about your email. I'm just limited by the amount of bandwidth uh, up in Alaska, and I will get back to you, I promise you, as quickly as I can. Something like that. Okay. Yeah, that's called an auto-reply, and that will work if you do it on the server because it doesn't connect to you. It doesn't get it from your computer. It gets it from Hotmail. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, and, and I don't then, need to bring anything special with me. No, Princess will have Wi-Fi. Okay, but you said it's slow, but, but it's just okay. It's slow, but it's there. I mean, you're going to find it a little frustrating, but it is there. So, and it's also expensive. You should check the the cruise information and find out. Usually, you buy packages of minutes. So, the key on that is you 
you log in, you download your email, and you immediately log out so that you're not okay. using up your minutes. You respond to all uh -huh. the email, then you log back in, and as long as the emails are quick and text-based, it won't take too long. So you okay. you will be in touch. It's just it it won't it won't be a hundred percent. It'll be a little frustrating for you. Okay. But it will work. I can deal with that. Yeah, and the, the nice thing because you're in Alaska, as long as Sprint has coverage in the areas, you know, you dock every day or almost every day. It's only when you're up by the glaciers there. There's that's probably right. there's probably no coverage there. And, and as you're reap as you know as you're sailing along the Seward Peninsula and stuff, there might not be coverage there. But as soon as you're in Anchorage or Ketchikan or Sitka, all the towns you're in, you'll have coverage. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> you won't be it won't be as bad as you think. And and besides, you're on vacation. Enjoy yourself. Well, I'll enjoy myself part of the time and the other part of the time. It's always a working vacation no matter where I go. I, I know. Believe me, I know. We really have to. And, or in the worst, th that's the worst case. The next best case is you have to do all your work ahead of time. So you work twice as hard for two weeks and then you take a vacation. <laughs> right. But see, we get referrals all the time. So that's what I have to be in. Oh, uh, yeah, I know you do. I know. We have the same situation with, with ad sales. Now, one thing do not do is they will have okay. phone service from the ship, the cruise ship. They call it uh, cellular at sea. Whatever you uh -huh. do, don't do that. It's really expensive. And it's just okay. for phone calls. You don't need the phone calls, I presume. I do not. Just the email. Email's right. a lot more affordable, a lot easier. And do, and do as much as you can when you're in port because that'll be quick. Okay, perfect. Have fun. Thank you very much. I appreciate your help. Bring a good camera. You're going to see amazing stuff. Okay, will do. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, Leo. I appreciate sure, it. Sure, anytime. It's time for the inestimable. Scott Wilkins. I don't know if that's a word. It's Scott Wilkins. I can't estimate him. It is actually a word. Inestimable. It's good, right? Inestimable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> or is it estimable? The estimable Scott Wilkinson. <laughs> I can never remember. Irregardless. He's here. Scott, <laughs> yeah. Scott Wilkinson not is not, that's not a real, Scott Wilkinson is a real person, even though he, Indeed. he looks like Santa Claus and he sounds <laughs> like Santa Claus. He is actually our home theater geek and he joins us every week. I, but you took last week off. I hope you had a good time. Had a great time playing brass music in the redwoods of Santa Cruz. Wow. That sounds awesome. It was great. It I was met really an, great. I met another tuba Christmas uh, player. He plays oh, in yeah? the uh, Midwest version of the tuba Christmas. I can't. I think it was in Twin Cities. I can't remember what city. Uh huh. Yeah, two hundred of them all. all over I the know. Country. I know. He loves it. He loves That's it. That's super cool. Did you see him at uh, S SXSW? SX South by Southwest. No, he was up here, but uh, we were at oh. South by Southwest. And as I was mentioning, Ready Player One. They've really got a big push on that. And Westworld. Uh -huh. Two, because the second season's coming, the Samurai season. Ooh. Ooh. So this is... I'm, I'm looking forward to Ready Player One, actually. It looks good. It, it, it should really be good. It should be good. Now I mean, you, it, you know, it's kind of Hunger Games, kind of, yeah, you know, yeah. kind of Tron. Yeah. A lot of but 80s still. references. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it should look fabulous. Well, that's the... And, of course, you're the home theater geek, so that's what we care about. Now, you saw the current big movie, Wrinkle in Time. Yeah, and I'm going to assume you saw it in Dolby Atmos in a Dolby <laughs> Vision Cinema, sitting yep. in reclining chairs with a fine. Sadly, no, sadly not. I oh. did see it in Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. But here's the weird thing: it Dolby Cinemas, which in the U.S. are all hosted by AMC, so they're all in AMC multiplexes, and one of the theaters in those multiplexes is a Dolby Cinema, and they have reclining chairs, as you say, and it's it's all very lovely. Um, but some of the Dolby, but Dolby cinemas can play whatever they want. Each theater is can decide what they want to put in the Dolby cinema. And some Dolby cinemas are showing a wrinkle in time right now, but others are not. They're sticking with Black Panther, which, which is up. also an amazing movie. I'm told. I oh, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I had a wonderful. How was time the? How were the? You said the visuals were very good. The H high dynamic range HDR visuals yes. were very good. Yes. In, how did in Black Panther and in uh, Wrinkle in Time? Well, I was going to ask, how did Wrinkle in Time compare? Yeah, yeah, very good. Not quite as good as Black Panther. Uh, I I felt that they weren't using the entire available vi visual or brightness dynamic range until the very end, huh. and then it got super black, and it was it was lovely. And I mean, the rest of the movie was was beautiful too. I mean, the the visuals, the CGI is just stunning. Now. 
some re- some reviews have said, well, yeah, but it kind of looks obviously computer generated. And I'd have to say in some cases that's true, but I sort of didn't care. It didn't matter to yeah. me. It didn't bother me, yeah. you know. So and it's just such a visual feast. I mean, you're you're gallivanting around the universe and and seeing visiting all these different planets and uh, it, it's really, it's really beautiful. It's a beautiful looking movie. The Atmos sound is gorgeous. I mean, they, they really took, took it out into the, into the room, you know, because as we know, Atmos not only has speakers around the room this way, but also overhead. And so when you, when things fly over, if, if the sound also flies over your head, that really increases the sense of immersion, the, the sense that you're there. Yeah, And so A Wrinkle in Time does that very well. One of my complaints about it is that it's got a bunch of teen pop songs in the soundtrack. Well, guess who it's aimed at? I know, I know. It's not aimed at me. <laughs> no. <laughs> Although, you know, I loved the book when I was a teenager. It was See, one of my I favorite books. I read it books. as a teenager too. Yeah. Exactly. It was it was seminal. And, and in to fact, me. that's a way I'm one of the reasons I'm I'm not going to go see it because I'm mm. I'm really I understand it doesn't really you know. It does. No, no, it book. stays it does cue to the book. It okay. does. Okay. However, I will say this also that it they added some scenes that aren't in the book. So it, there's more. To, the book is all there virtually, oh, okay. but okay. there's more to it than that. And to tell you the truth, I, I found some of those added scenes to be kind of draggy. <laughs> and, and the whole movie is just just like a, a, a minute under two hours. Yeah. And it, it actually felt kind of long. How You know, is that something that's changed the length of movies? I, I, when I was a kid, I think it was understood all movies are two hours, right? Two hours. Right. Although when I watch the old, you know, like Thin Man movies, those tend to be 90 minutes. Those are shorter. Exactly. The really old ones. Yeah, the really Nowadays, old ones. Nowadays, I think two hours is considered short. Short? Yeah. Movies are getting longer? Movies. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Black Panther, I think, is two hours and 20 minutes, something like that. Huh. Uh, uh, Dunkirk was certainly three hours. <laughs> Felt that like was it. that was kind of yeah. <laughs> Are we ever getting off this beach? Come on, man. Let's get off this well, it's beach. Just, it's oh. just how they felt. Yeah, know? it's like, well, it was very very authentic in that. Anyway, regard. so yeah. the the answer to your original question is, I didn't see it in a Dolby Cinema because the Dolby Cinemas near me were playing Black Panther, not A Wrinkle in Time. So I went down to Hollywood, California, where they're I've it, heard Disney of Hollywood. Has, yes, they're yes. in California now. Okay. That's yes, right. exactly. Yeah. They moved. <laughs> um, they there is a Hollywood, Florida, which I is know. why I say that. I anyway. Know. Uh, Disney has its own theater down there called the El Capitan, and they were showing uh, A Wrinkle in Time in Dolby Vision HDR and Dolby Atmos surround uh, sound, immersive sound, um, but they don't have the nice seats. It's an old theater. It's one of these old grand theaters, right, oh, with all yeah, the yeah. decor see, I like and stuff. That. It's pretty that. cool, except yeah. the seats are from that same era. <laughs> they haven't upgraded the seats. <laughs> well, you know, people had smaller butts back then. Uh, true. I don't true. know. I don't know. That's, I'm making that up. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh, not necessarily it's, it's the worth, best, most comfortable, but but a good look. No. Yeah. A beautiful look to yeah. the movie and a beautiful sound to the movie. Um, I, I think I, I too, like you, was a super big fan of the book. And so I, when I saw the, the trailer last year, I said, oh, man, that's going to be great. And for the most part, it is. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. There were some problems yeah. with it. I wrote a review on AVS Forum. So if you want to get a oh, deeper good. sense of that's, what I... That's where Scott uh, hangs his hat, the AVS Forum at avsforum.com. Right. Exactly right. I, exactly. Uh, I wonder if the, the what's changed for movies... I mean, they're competing now with television shows we were talking about westworld and they're coming back and you know where you have not two hours to develop a story but but 10 15 sometimes Mm -hmm. 23 hours to develop a show yep and uh and characters and so forth and i wonder if that is is somewhat pushing movies to be longer i don't know i think that's a good question (laughs) i don't know (laughs) 
you know that Netflix just won its first Oscar, right? I know, and, uh, and so that, that and that's an important historical thing for movies and and yes. so on because delivering it at home it gets an Oscar. I mean, yes. that's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's a real movie, even though it never showed in theater. Did it ever show in it's, theaters? I don't think so. No, we're talking about Icarus, the doc best documentary. Is that what we're talking? Yeah, about? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh, yeah. the documentary of the year. It never showed in theaters. Maybe. Sh well, I wonder what the rules it, are for the it, Academy. Uh, yeah, it exactly. must have it to show have. a few times, right? It, it might. It probably did. Yeah. I, I don't know that for sure. But most people will have seen it on Netflix. Exactly, on yeah. TV. And it's not the first time. I mean, Amazon, uh, of course, last year with Manchester by the Sea, which was cr was funded by Amazon Prime. Right. But didn't restrict itself to play on Amazon It was still Prime. theatrical release. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder the if the Oscars, is they're going to have to change their rules, maybe, huh? Maybe. May, <laughs> it may very well be. What is a movie? Imagine, what does it mean to be a movie? Right, exactly. And eligible for an Oscar. Yeah. I think Wrinkle in Time will certainly get nominations for production design and visual right. effects and that right. sort of stuff, because right. it was beautiful. Well, yeah, maybe I'll go see it then. Nowadays, <laughs> though, I think, I'm, I'm, and I'm not alone, I, with a good TV, an HDR, 4K TV, and a good surround sound system, yep. it, there's not as much pressure to see it in a theater Yep, uh, I agree. If, if you're going to be able to see it at home in a, in a good quality. Yep, Scott Wilkinson, that's what he does. He helps us build our own home theater experience at avsforum.com and joins us every week. Thank you, Scott. That Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And now, for your edification, Zonk. Scott Wilkinson will stick around and answer I, questions. I shall. I'm happy to do so. Thank you. I so, how's it. everybody doing? Um, I saw a note back here a little bit. Uh, oh, yeah, Web 9130, waiting out for Isle of Dogs and Early Man. Early Man's going to be hilarious. I'm sure of that. I don't think it's going to be graded in Dolby Vision, though, which is unfortunate because uh, uh, it'll look it would look even better at that. But you know, Early Man is I don't know Isle of Dogs. I mean, I assume it's about an island full of dogs, but but uh, Early Man is from the same animation studio that brought us Wallace and Gromit and Chicken Run. So it's kind of a claymation, British claymation, uh, Ard Ardmore Studios, Ard something Studios, not Ardvark. Um, uh, yes, Tokyo Jim, I didn't talk at all about home theater this time. I, I, that is true. And I apologize for that. Uh, and web 9130, you're right. There was an earlier version of a wrinkle in time, 2003 it was, and it was a TV movie. It wasn't in the theaters. It was a TV movie and it was horrible. It was also made by Disney, which is amazing to me. So Disney made this movie in 2003. It was before Madeline Lengel, the author of the novel, died. And she thought it was horrible. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it never went anywhere. It probably still is available on Amazon or somewhere. Uh, but uh, I remember watching it and not being happy with it. So I was really happy when this one came out. And it did a much better job, I think. Uh, a much better job. Uh, yes, Robert Bigelow, Chicken Run is hilarious. I love that movie. Uh, Tachi just installed a new home theater, and OMG, huge difference uh, compared to uh, you know a TV with its own speakers or whatever. You bet it's a huge difference. Uh, what'd you get? What what uh, equipment do you have in there? What display? What speakers? What uh, um, uh, AV receiver or anything like that? Inquiring minds want to know. Sybil says the art uh, that Ardmore, Ardmore Studios, what it was, also did The Angry Kid. I never saw that one. I don't know about that one. I'll have to look it up. Um, and Lost in Space is being remade again. Uh, Ray Zarius, uh, I, I don't think I, I haven't seen the trailers. Um, Oh, Compter is is suggesting a service called Cinema, S I N E M I A. Um I think th isn't that some sort of uh, online movie service? Oh, a monthly movie ticket plans. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So it's kind of like Movie Pass. Uh it's a different it's a different thing sort of like Movie Pass. That's interesting. 
I wonder if they show you, we miss you already. Oh, no, I just, no, I don't want that. <clears throat> um, cinema membership, you can get three movie tickets for less than the price of one. IMAX, 4DX, XD, ScreenX, D-Box experience. I certainly, well, Dolby Cinemas have a kind of a D-Box. I wonder if it, ha if it includes Dolby Cinema. If so, then I would be uh, interested in that. I'm not sure MoviePass does. I think it's kind of limited to sort of normal, but somebody there can tell me. Uh, excuse me, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of geek and taste. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888, ask Leo the phone number. Thank you, Mick. Uh, Ed in Temecula is next. Hi, Ed. Hi, Leo. Welcome. Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Oh, just fine. Sitting here on the porch watching the rain come down. Isn't it nice, though, to get a little rain? Beautiful. We need it. Yep. So I wanted to talk to you about home theater. Uh, specifically, I'm setting up a, a room. It's a 20 by 20-ish room. And um, I want to talk to you about building... A video wall. A video. Well, you know, it's good Scott Wilkinson stuck around. Yeah, how apropos. <laughs> how apropos. <laughs> I've got two experts on my side. So when you say right. a video wall, you want the whole wall to have video? No, no. no. It's um, how far? How far distant from the screen will you be? Approximately. 14 feet. So that is pretty far, and that's what determines how big the screen will be, really, because you want a, a movie theater experience, I presume, so you want to have it... I don't, you know... If you ask the Dolby folks, they have a calculator that I think is aggressive. It makes... It says have a big, much bigger screen than necessarily you would want. Where do you sit in the movie theater would be a, a question to ask, right? If, if you like... I know people go all the way in the back. My wife will do that. I say, honey, <laughs> I want to sit down front. I want the big screen. So, uh, it, so right. that's really the question to ask is, where do you like to sit in the movie theater? Right. Do you well, want the screen to... Closer than further. Yeah, you want the screen to kind... You know, you're never going to get the screen to, like, IMAX, where you have to look around on the screen. That's not even a good idea. But you want it to kind of get to your peripheral vision. So, so you right. know... How many degrees is that, Scott? I don't know. Is that 60 degrees? Oh, it's something something like 60 degrees, yeah. What would, would you recommend screen size for 14 feet? Well, pretty big. 60 degrees. You're pretty would, far would back, be, aren't you? You're pretty far. 14 feet. The average in a home is like 9 or 10 feet. Yeah. So 14 feet's pretty far. Yeah. Uh, so you're going to want a pretty big screen. So uh, my first it sounds like he's going to go projection, right? Well, that was the one choice, you know. It's either projector or uh, what is really what I really kind of uh, dialed into was uh, putting up four flat screens in an array and using a matrix. No, no, no. I, I do not recommend that. I do not recommend okay. that because you will see the boundaries between the screens. Well, that's true, and and that would be just tremendously distracting to me. You only I mean, see that in trade shows where people are f pretty distant, right? right? And they right. aren't going to see the boundaries. If you're not going to use a projector and and you have unlimited funds, <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I, you know, I would say if one had unlimited funds and wanted to do what you're suggesting, I would go with something new from Samsung called The Wall. Ooh. And I've Which seen is, those and they are pretty pricey. Tremendous, but they're extremely pricey. They're not even available yet. They will be later this year. Is but, that you the know, one uh, with the uh, the new megapixel or whatever it is? It's it's called micro LED. Micro LED. Okay. It's a direct emitting light uh, screen with tiny little LEDs that produce the image, and it's 146 inches uh, diagonally, so that would be plenty big for your seating distance. Yeah. Um, but it's you know it's going to be in the six figures, easy. Easy. Yeah, that's not going to work. So I was that's not going to happen. And right? this is why I said <laughs> 90 inches. You want a projector. You want to. You do. You want a projector. You, okay. You're absolutely right. Are will you be, be able to? Sorry. Go ahead. Are they going to be bright enough? Are you going to be able to control the light in the room? Is to the some next degree. question. Yeah, you, your projector well, you does need... require that you be able to darken the room because yes, either that or 
you get what's called an ambient light rejecting screen, an ALR screen. And most of the big screen companies make them, and they do allow some ambient light in the room, and you can still have a nice picture on the screen. Okay. Um, so that is going to be probably the best recommendation. If you can't control the light completely, then put a put an ambient light rejecting screen in there and many projectors. You can get projectors. In. I, I recommend not spending less than about three grand on a projector in order to get good enough what i consider good enough quality. although given that you know the runco projectors you see in uh, you know really nice theaters and, and home theaters oh, can yeah, be tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of hundreds thousands. of thousands yeah yeah, yeah exactly so, so three thousand isn't really very much and what brand <laughs> what brand names do you like for home theater well projectors? i i like epson in the low end um very much uh i like um should he look for uh 1080p because i know that's i you can't get really a 4k a true 4k projector i don't even know if they make them well you can't you can't sony makes them sony's it's the only company that's expensive no, no no they're they're least ex, their least expensive 4k projector is five thousand bucks worth it i think so absolutely is it hdr yes well yes. i think if you're future proofing you want to you're going to want to go there so sony yeah huh? yeah the only problem with the sony the five thousand dollar one is that its HDMI port doesn't operate at full bandwidth. And therefore, there are certain specific and at this moment rare circumstances that it won't work. Why? But, why? Wait a minute. Why would you? I know. I <laughs> know. That's, that's, that's a strange oversight, if you ask me. Well, I, I think it was a, a design decision, and I disagree with it heartily, majorly. Yeah. Uh, Compter is also mentioning JVC. I forgot to mention JVC. They, do, they have they H, don't, do they have 4K, though? Not true 4K. How they important have is 4K for... for much uh, less important than HDR, in my opinion. Because you're so distant at 14 feet. Oh, yeah. You're, you're not, not going to... You don't yeah, see the pixels the at 10. the screen is huge. Okay. Yeah. Right. 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 No, so a JVC would work just fine. An Epson would work just fine. Those both do what I call pixel wiggling. Right, so they take they take each pixel and they wiggle it quickly back and forth between two positions <laughs> to simulate 4K. This is, a, by the way, not the official term for it is obvious not, no. reasons. <laughs> oh, I want that TV with the pixel wiggling. What's that? <laughs> no, no, you don't. Yeah. Okay, so oh, that's yeah. a good thing. That's to simulate. That's interpolating in effect. It's interpolating essentially. Correct. And and the JVC is is probably the the one that most people think of right away as sort of the premier now, affordable projector line. Does, and they're, in the, they're starting at the four or $5,000 range as well. There's also, uh, Ed, you, a decision to make on screen. He mentioned this light-rejecting screen. Can you paint that on the wall, or do you have to have that be a real Ooh, screen? Ooh, I don't know if... if Because I love you, the idea, and it's it's not cheap but it's probably a little less than a great screen it's certainly a lot, oh yeah yeah a lot is. simpler because you don't have to have the screen and hanging and all that you yes. paint the wall with the screen material yep and there really is like a movie wall yep it's the the primary company that produces that is called goo system goo g-o-o G -O -O. Yeah. Uh, but you have to be careful about painting it to make sure that it's very smooth right texture right you don't want yeah, textured drywall. You want flat. You, no, flat, precisely, flat. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. That's the key right there. <clears throat> the other thing, I was although the goo is mention, thick, and the goo will somewhat compensate for a little bit of irregularities in the drywall. Yes, yes, it will. But how you apply it, I think, is kind of important yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, they have very. They talk a lot about that in the on the goo site. On the goo site, yes. <laughs> the other quick thing I want to mention is twenty by twenty is not the ideal. Uh, di you know, dimensions of a room. I'm, 20 doesn't matter, but a square room is not ideal. So you're going to want to think about acoustic treatments if you want. Oh, you know, really? Because excellent the walls are parallel. Right. Get... Well, no, the walls are the wall. Basically, the room modes, the frequencies at which you get standing waves, uh, are happen in both the both directions, right? Both longitudinally so Ed, and unless, laterally. Ed, unless this is a hobby thing and you really want to become an expert on this, I would suggest a, a home theater installer. I, we, it, it, as much as they are going to add to it, they're going to add expertise that is very hard to get. Mm -hmm. Would you agree, Scott? I mean, somebody who really knows what they're doing, I think, is the oh, best yeah. way to go with this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially acoustics. That's, Once you're that's spending a tricky that much subject. money. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. 
I guess I forgot to ask what the what the overall budget is. Well, we've blown was... his budget, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Ed, there, there, right, at it least, always happens. There's so some... if you're going to go down the uh, projector path, um, what can you advise me in terms of lumens? Everything is in lumens. Hang, so, hang on oh. for a second. I'm going to let you uh, you and Scott talk uh, off the air because we're going to uh, we have to take a break. All right. The beauty of this is that we can continue this conversation in the podcast. So I am going to pull Scott back up and Ed back up, and you guys can just enjoy yourself. And I will turn the the sound from the radio off. And you've Very got good. you've and got 511 seconds. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. So, Ed, you're still um, there, right? So, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, lumens. You asked about lumens, yes. which is the amount of light coming out of a projector. And as somebody here in the chat room said, the more the better. And that's generally true. Um, however, I will also say that lumens are to projectors as watts are to amplifiers or AV receivers. In other words, the manufacturers do whatever they can to get the highest possible number, sure. even if it's, you know, even if it's unrealistic. So, you know, you have to take that with a grain of salt. You can't even compare. You can't even say, OK, well, even if the number is wrong, this one's putting out more lumens than this one. So this one's going to that the first one's going to be brighter. But the manufacturer might have done might have performed that test a different way. So you can't even it's not even apples to apples, which is really unfortunate. We don't have um, any standard for that yet. Sadly not. Well, there sort of is, but people don't really follow it. So okay. it, there isn't really. Um, so I would say more the better, generally speaking. Although I will also say that if you get the projector calibrated, which I suggest you do, I recommend it, uh, you're going, it's going to be lower output, lumen output than what the specs say. Or than it than the uncalibrated mode. So, for example, so if you measured the the light output of a projector before you calibrated it, and then after you calibrated it, and you measured it in the same way, the calibrated output would be lower. Uh, so there's that, and that's another reason to a either use an ambient light rejecting screen or to be able to completely control the ambient light in the room. Um, so that's going to be. Uh, one issue. Uh, like I said, the, the acoustics are, are going to be pretty bad in a square room just by nature. So acoustic treatments are going to be kind of important. Somebody here in the chat room was saying also multiple subwoofers. And I do agree with that. If you get at least two subwoofers, mm -hmm. that will help, and you place them properly, that will help reduce the uh, what are called room modes or um, standing waves. And Somebody else in the chat room mentioned, you know, is there a buildup in the middle of the room? Well, yes, there is at certain frequencies. So you don't want to sit in the dead center of the room. You want your seating to be a little off center. Um, so there There'll is. There will be other things in the room, too. So it's not just a yeah, so, room. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Now, if you're going to have a lot of carpeting or, you know, a fluffy wallpaper, <laughs> then maybe it'll be okay. <laughs> I kind of doubt you'll have fluffy wallpaper, but probably not. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you do want to give some thought to it. Now, are, are you a DIYer? Are you going to like put this together yourself? Well, that was you gonna... the intent, and I, and I am. I've got an engineering background, and been... oh well, then you can certainly do it. You can certainly yeah. do it. Uh, I, I definitely recommend going to uh, at my my website avsforum.com. Certainly will. Uh, where and there's a forum there called, uh, I think, Dedicated Theater Builder or something like that. Okay. And you'll see a bunch of people who have built their own theaters. Um, so that that should, and they're very helpful and, and ready and willing to help people. Uh, and, and they've got, you know, obviously they've got collected experience far more than I do. So, uh, you know, you go there, you post a question and you'll get a lot of help. No question. Great. Or rather, a lot of questions. <laughs> I also recommend you take a look at um, there's a on the home page of AVS forum. There's a tab. One of the things in the nav bar is called features. And then under that is home theater of the month. And every month I feature a home theater this this month, uh, March, 
uh, is a completely DIY home theater. The guy built everything with his own two hands and spent under $11,000 for everything. Wow. So that was very inspirational. <laughs> I mean, some people spend, you know, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars or more, and sometimes that involves hiring, you know, a contractor mm -hmm. uh, to to come in and install it and do everything. As Leo said, that's a good thing to do if if you need more expertise than you have. Um, but I think if you go and on AVS and look at a bunch of of the build threads are called build threads of people who have built their own home theaters. You'll get a lot of ideas. Okay. I'll certainly do that. Thank you for that. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. One Thanks. other quick question or you got to sure. go? No, you got time. No, I, I, we got time. A hundred and some seconds. Okay. Um, back to the uh, LCD path. If I remove the bezels, does that alleviate some of the banding that we have the issue with? Oh, you're talking about the borders? Yes. Yes, but not entirely. And since you're an engineer, you probably aren't afraid to try and do that. But you'll certainly void the warranty. That's true. Um, That's one of and, the things that I was uh, taking advantage of. Yeah, and it, yeah, yeah. If, if you t I mean, for, LCD, for say, 65-inch... LCDs. I'd have to do the math. What does that come out to in total screen size? Uh, uh, Thirty diagonal. That was going to go with four forty-fives. Oh, four forty-fives. Okay. So that makes a total of what? That gives you a ninety diagonal. Okay. So there are no ninety-inch LCD TVs available anymore. They're they're coming. There there are um, actually Samsung showed an eighty-five inch eight K. Although that's going to be mega expensive too at CES this year. Um, if you can get, if you could get by with a seventy-five inch, you mm -hmm. can get some pretty good deals. Uh, you know, on seventy-five inches. We just posted on AVS uh, the the prices of the new uh, the new um, TVs, the twenty eighteens from LG and Samsung. And for example. Samsung has a 75 inch Q6 for 3,500 bucks. Um, 75s might might be big enough, huh? Might be. It I might scooch be. Scooch the couch a little closer. All right. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, what'll happen if you get the 75 and you're sitting 14 feet away? You'll go. Uh, you might say this is great, and then you're fine. Or you might say, right. yeah, let's get a little closer. And if you can, if you can, if you have three feet, you could scooch in. That might make a difference. You know. Cali might. Calibrate your distance to the screen. Exactly. 75 is about as big as you can get, though, right? Yes. Except for uh, the there, Samsung thing that they're the doing. The Samsung thing. There are a couple other companies that are that are talking about 85 or 88-inch TVs, but those Crazy. are still pretty expensive. Crazy. The 77-inch LG C8 OLED is nine grand, so that's wow. pretty expensive. Vizio apparently has a 75-inch on sale right now, according to the chat. Uh, they do. In fact, they go up to 80. Yeah. And uh, Those would be certainly, all right. yeah, that'd be all right. And the the LG, I mean, sorry, the Vizio at, um, oh, I think they have an 80 inch. If you can get that in a P series, the the P series is the one to get from Vizio. The M, the step down M series is okay, but the P series is is better. Ed so. and uh, Scott, I'm gonna have to let you go. Thank you, Ed. All right. I appreciate it. Thank Great you for everything. I loved it. All right, take care. Have fun. Thank you, Scott. We'll see you uh, next week. See you next week. All you right, bet. take care. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers and the internet and home theater and digital photography and smartphones and smart watches and all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the number if you have a question, a comment, a suggestion, you want to talk high tech. 888-827-5536. It's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. 8888-ASK-LEO. The website, and I, I should mention this more often, I wish I did, I just forget, is techguylabs.com. And it's free, there's no sign up, there's no fee to join it, but that is where everything we talk about on the show uh, gets put and is, you know, the links and everything. So you don't have to write anything down. James DeRuvo is out there working so hard. Thank you, James, to get everything we talk about on the website. And then after the fact, we put audio and video from the show. Yeah, we even shoot video of the show. I don't know why. Uh, up there. 
Uh, and you can, so you can, if you hear something and you want to know more, you can go and uh, read about it. You can actually comment there as well, ask a question, or, or if you're yelling at the radio saying, oh, I've got a better way, you can do that too, there too. It's all free. TechGuyLabs.com. On we go with the show, and Al's on the line from Upland, California, our next caller. Hi, Al. Hi, Leo. How you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. I'm a uh, 27-year survivor of working for General Telephone. Oh, wow. And uh, <laughs> left, left the system in 95, so I come out on the cusp of the wave of, uh, of technology, so I know just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> uh, recently, I've had to go to... Um, uh, satellite internet uh, using HughesNet, and uh, because we're in a mobile home park, and we really only have two choices: either satellite or uh, we could use DSL, which is what right. I was using. Right. But I could only get to a mo to a max of five download. Um, fortunately, with satellite, I can get far more than that. But I've also had to become very conscious, cautious, or conscious of uh, the amount of data I'm using. Yes, indeed. And so what I'm wondering is, is there is some kind of software or something I can put into the net that I can keep good track of multiple devices and how much data they're using? You Effectively, you want uh, uh, like one of those uh, power meters, electric meters that are on the side of the house telling you how much you've used. But inst much, yeah. instead of electricity, you want it to monitor data. Now, the... There's certainly ways to do this for individual devices. As you probably know, your smartphone will tell you how much data you've used. Windows 10, Windows 10 now has a feature that will tell you how much data it's used. But you want to monitor everything, all the devices, including probably, I don't know, you watch Netflix, maybe a Roku or an Apple TV or something. Uh, well, I do have, I have a TV that's on the net, but it's just using, um, it's just regular data. Then, yeah, but it's still using uh, bandwidth. So in other words, in order exactly. to get that information that... Uh, by the way, I would think HughesNet would give you that information. That you, One way to do is check the ISP. Most ISPs, especially those with they, bandwidth caps like HughesNet, will tell you. They they do, yes. I, I've got the... They have a, a meter type thing. Right. Um, it's, it's general in and out of... You just cut out. It just cut out. I think I lost him. He was cutting in and out as it was. Let's see. It's a if, pretty basic oh, meter. Back. It's not It's broken down into hourly or anything like that. It basically just shows a day. And you want something more granular. And in particular, you'd like to see which devices, right? Individual devices. Correct. What it amounts to is uh, between my wife and I, and we're the only two in the house, uh, we have uh, two, uh, two iMacs two iPads, and two um, uh, cell phone uh, eights. Right. So the best way to do this <clears throat> is in a router, because the router, the problem is you have satellite internet, which means you probably are using their router, right? Or do you that have your, do you, are you able to have your own router connected to the satellite box? Yes. You are. Okay. So uh, many routers have this kind of uh, information, bandwidth usage information, uh, built into them. Uh, yours might even. Do you know what kind you have? I don't. Uh, the, the router that we're using right now is just the one from Usenet. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, still look in there because it's in their interest that you keep an eye on bandwidth use. They're trying to, you know, they have all these uh, f uh, fair access uh, rules and so forth, and they're really trying to, that's one of the limitations of satellite internet is that the, they they pay very close attention to bandwidth use, and it's easy to trigger something so i guess it you need to get a router uh you can use a third-party router that's good news that will have bandwidth usage statistics in it and there are lots of them um i use uh every uh, edge router x from um a company called uh ubiquity that's about 50 bucks a very inexpensive router it it, it has that information built into it you can actually uh, do a lot of interesting things very geeky uh, including monitoring broadband uh, consumption by device, because as you as you know, every time a device gets on your network, it's given an IP address. So you'll have to do a little bit of legwork to say, yeah, that 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 there, 
that device, that's the Roku, or that there thing, that's my iPhone. But generally, you'll get a, a some sort of indication as to what it is. Android phone, it'll say, or it'll say Apple iPhone, and then you can assign it to the uh, right person. So that so the the key is to look and see if there's a traffic meter in your router. Oh, many many routers do have it. I I would be surprised if the Hughes router doesn't. But if it but if it doesn't, uh, Ubiquity's Edge Router X is fifty dollars. TP-Link routers, I believe, do that. Um, I think the Asus routers uh, will have that. Just look for a router with uh, information about bandwidth usage by device. That's the key. Um, and and uh, chat room, if you if you have a favorite router that you use that has this kind of bandwidth monitoring, go ahead and fire away in the chat room. We'll capture that. We'll put it in the show notes at techguylabs.com. So a lot of manufacturing. This is increasingly common, frankly, in routers that they're monitoring that kind of. Uh, per device bandwidth usage. It's very handy to have, right? Kind of know what what the bandwidth hogs are. And even more sophisticated routers will uh, do something called quality of service where they will uh, QoS, where they will say, okay, this router, this router, uh, this device is prioritized. Uh, you're just getting email on that, but you're streaming video on this one. So this one's going to get all the packets in order and then when we're done doing that, we're going to give you your email. Uh, that kind of thing is very handy. Asus routers. Uh, yeah, I th I th my Asus, I believe, had that. Uh, Missing says his Asus router has a bandwidth log. The Nighthawks. Um, so, yeah, a lot of them do. I'm not sure which I would recommend. TP-Link makes some really nice routers. I would start there. They're very inexpensive. And as I said, I, I do get those uh, stats from my Edge Router X, which I like a lot. That's from Ubiquiti, U-B-I-Q-U-I-T-I. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number, if you have a better suggestion. The Zycel Netgear. Netgear? No, I think you mean Netgear, right, Roastro? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Zycel uh, routers. I'm not sure I recommend Zycel routers these days. They're a little pricey, and they've had some security issues that worry me. Uh, TP-Link I like a lot. Those are very good routers. My phone number, 8888-ASK-LEO, the website, techguylabs.com. We're collecting routers in our chat room at irc.twit.tv. Lots of ways to play our game. Please give me a ring. I wasn't really going to try some wine during the radio show, but now it's time for Wink. I love Wink. We went down and visited their facility. They're a winery, by the way. They're not a wine reseller. This is really important. We went down and visited them in L.A. a couple of weeks ago and had a wine tasting. Fabulous, delicious wine from Wink, W-I-N-C. Now, if I'd ask you, pick out a wine you'll love but you haven't had before, where would you start? You've never tasted it before. Start with Wink because they have wine experts that match. In fact, if I should go to the website because it's so cool. They match the wines they recommend to your taste buds. So go to trywink.com slash tech guy. T-R-Y-W-I-N-C dot com slash tech guy. And the onboarding process, it's really great. They ask you what you like. So let's get started, shall we? How do you like your coffee? Strong and black? Mild, nothing in it? Cream and sugar, frappuccinoed, I don't. This is not about coffee, but they're they're trying to get a sense of what you like. I actually like it with cream, okay? How do you feel about salt? I put it on everything. Use it. Sometimes bothers me when food is undersalted. Like the taste, don't miss it. I, I think I'm going to say second of those. Do you like citrus? Love it. Earthy flavors, black mushrooms, truffles. So you, what we're doing is we're going through a taste profile here. Simple questions that, frankly, no wine store clerk is going to ask you or even be able to translate into a recommendation. But once you answer these, Wink has a good idea of what you like and can make a recommendation. Select red or white or both. Wink works with top winemakers and growers from around the world. They make their own wine. And then they ship it to you. Now, you have to check to see what your state regulations are. But in most states, you can get... I just got my Wink box, so this is a good time to open this up. I have found some of the best wines I've ever had from Wink. Four wines, 
You can get it once a month, which is just about right. Have it for a special meal or a special occasion. Although, I have to say, we have a Pinot that, that they make at Wink that I like so much. Maybe I'm going to get a couple extra bottles of that. <laughs> it's, it is literally a wine company. They make their own wine. Every year there are insanely delicious wines. Get ready for the summertime. Their summer water rosé is super popular. I had some of that. I loved it. Here's my, can I, I don't know, can you see this? Here's my Wink wine. I'm going to open it up. All the information you need, nicely packaged in the Wink box. Let's pull out some Wink wine here. Kin, I love the labels too. Kin and Country. It's a Cabernet Sauvignon, Vista del Sol Vineyards. Some of these are wines that you, uh, in fact, all, I think most of these are wines you can't get anywhere. Oh, this is a Malbec from Argentina. I love, you know what? I think Lisa picked these wines. She loves the, I can tell. She loves two Malbecs. Yeah, that's Lisa right there. She loves the Malbecs. And here's a, a California wine, a Cabernet Sauvignon Oak Aged Pacificana. So Wink is a great way to get uh, introduce yourself to new wines, new flavors, new tastes. Each month, new delicious wines. There's no membership fees. You don't you you can skip over any month, cancel any time. Shipping is covered. So if you don't like a bottle they send you, they'll replace it with a bottle you love, no questions asked. You just it's a great way to get to know wine and they have some special wines. I have I have another box. Uh, which I, I don't want to open, but there's some special wines in here that just, you can't get anywhere. They're so good. So why settle for the same bottle you get every time you go to the store? Discover great wine at a very affordable price today. In fact, if you go to trywink.com slash techguy, T-R-Y-W-I-N-C dot com slash techguy, you'll get $20 off your first shipment. Trywink.com slash techguy. I met the winemaker uh, at Wink. They have a wine. They pick the grapes at, at midnight. They don't pick it in the daytime. They need it to be cool when they pick the grapes. And it's the most amazing wine. And they, there's not very much of it because there's only a few small vineyards where they grow these grapes. I uh, Unbelievable. But you can get it at Wink. Trywink.com slash tech guy. Get you $20 off right now. And I think you will find some new favorites. No membership fees. Just great wine. Wink with a C, W-I-N-C. Try wink.com slash tech guy. Do you have, oh, Lisa, you've been holding out on me. This is the one we like, right? Is this the one that was picked at midnight? The field theory? I, believe it I think it was the field theory. Yeah. I think it was. Lisa's been holding out. Look at these. These are cool little bottles. I can't really, I have to hold up like this. They're, they're kind of special bottles. And you got the two Malbecs, right? I knew that was you. You love your... Yeah, so this is a regular bottle. This is the same amount of wine, though, right? Yeah. It's just a kind of fun-looking... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hand-picked, de-stemmed, fermented whole berry, aged nine months in neutral French oak barrels. The Field Theory. This is the one we loved from Paso Robles, right? And you can buy that on the website. You can get this on the website? Yeah, on the website. Look, if you, if, you just, if you don't believe me, just try... That Field Theory is so good. It is, our, it is our regular pour now, right? If I have a nice steak... When we make a nice steak, we get the field theory out. It is so good. My mouth is watering. Trywink.com slash tech guy. That field theory blew me away, but I can't wait to try these Malbecs. Those are from Argentina. This one, Kin and Country, Fistas del Sol. Lodi. Just great wine that you will drink and love. And the shipping's always included, which is really great. And it's not a resale. I really, I really want to emphasize that. They're, they're not selling other people's wines. They make their own wine. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888, ask Leo the phone number. I get around. I'm going to get around right now to uh, Silmar, California. That's where Gary is. Hi, Gary. Yes. Good morning, Leo. Good morning. How are you today? I am doing fine. I just want to thank you for taking my call. I have something of an embarrassing confession. I have an old 3G Android phone, ah. which is on its last leg, <laughs> believe it or not. It's got voice, text, internet, and a basic camera. But the kicker is, the reason why I kept this phone is that it has a slider keyboard for my stubby fingers. I cannot 
understand those virtual keyboards. So I'm desperate as to what you can recommend, and I'm willing to pay anything in the neighborhood of $300 if that's possible for anything you could suggest is appreciated. Yeah, uh, there. BlackBerry still makes Android. They make Android phones now, by the way, not BlackBerry phones, but they still make Android phones with uh, keyboards. I had the BlackBerry Priv. That's under $300. Uh, I think 229 right now on Amazon.com. Their newer device, the Key One, has a somewhat better keyboard, but it's also $500. The nice thing about these Blackberries is they're pretty clean Android. They've done a fairly good job of it. Uh, there aren't a lot, unfortunately, of Android devices with keyboards anymore. In fact, I think BlackBerry may be the last company making them. They were the first company to make phones with keyboards and the, and the last. They're, they're never giving up. <laughs> Uh, although, uh, you know, I had a Priv. I, I was impressed by it. These are tiny keys, though. Uh, I don't know. The slider keyboards generally are bigger keys. They're almost normal-sized keys. So one option for you is to get a better phone, because this isn't the greatest phone, but uh, maybe get a Motorola um, Moto G5 Plus, for instance, which should be somewhere in your price range, somewhat in your price range, and then get a uh, maybe external keyboard uh, for it, a Bluetooth keyboard. Um, who was it? Was it, I want to say, it was some Hollywood celebrity <clears throat> made a slip-on keyboard for Android devices. And he got sued by BlackBerry, I believe, because <laughs> they, they said, wait a minute, th that's our keyboard you're sliding on. Uh, I don't know what if they're still out there. These these add-on keyboards. I'm trying to see if I can find it. Who was it that made that? Remember that? I, I, it wasn't Ashton Kutcher. It was one. It was uh, one of one of those guys. Was it Will I Am? Maybe I can't remember. Anyway, I don't know if that's still around. But that was an interesting idea. You take a, a, a normal. Oh, it was Ryan Seacrest. Absolutely right. It was Ryan Seacrest. Come to think of it, and he made it for the iPhone. Thank you, Addisync. Addisync in our chat room has a better memory than I do. It wasn't for Android. It was for the iPhone. I don't know if it's still out there. It was kind of a kludgy invention because it slid onto the bottom of the iPhone. Uh, Compter is saying that Samsung makes slide-on keyboards for the Galaxy S8. Maybe they'll make one for the S9. I don't know. I think you're, I think you're better off, uh, frankly, just getting one with one built in and that would probably be in this day and age of blackberry the good news is the blackberry priv isn't so expensive blackberry kills ryan seacrest's iphone keyboard that was called the typo okay see there's a problem right there the lawsuit settlement this was from a few years ago means no more typo keyboards i guess uh seacrest decided not worth getting sued so they made it for the iphone 6 blackberry sued him uh, and uh, according to press releases issued by BlackBerry, Typo permanently agreed to permanently discontinue selling keyboards for smartphones and mobile devices. That's it. <laughs> never, never again. Seemed like a good idea at the time. I think really there's only one recommendation in your price point, and that's the BlackBerry Priv, P-R-I-V. You still buy it on Amazon. It's an unlocked phone. You would uh, put in the SIM card that matches... Uh, your, your particular carrier. In almost all cases, you can do that. Pat is next. Hi, Pat. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Welcome back. Hey, how you doing, Leo? I'm doing great. What can I do for you? Hey, I just had a question. Um, my I had an old Samsung phone, and I have a metal clipboard. I want, can I get one of the magnet with a sticky back and stick it on the back of my phone? It will not hurt it. It's very common nowadays, uh, in fact, to put magnets on the back of smartphones for mounting on in the car and so forth. I've seen a number of devices that will do that. Uh, pretty strong magnets. These new uh, these new magnets are using the the uh, uh, that, that a new magnetic rare earth material that is very very strong, and then you need that if it's going to just hang off a magnet in your car. It can't, it can't uh, fall loose. And that doesn't seem in any way to, to bother phones. So, yes, you can. And there are a number of companies that make these. Look look for magnetic phone cases. For a long time, I used a company called Rockform, R-O-K-F-O-R-M. 
Uh, they made some great cases that had ma very strong rare earth magnets in the back of the phone. And then they made mounts that you could put all over the place. And you just, whoop, the phone would just, boom, boom, right on there with the magnet. It would work very well. Somebody's reminding me that there is a new company uh, doing a Kickstarter. In fact, I, <laughs> I, I, I actually paid for this. I'm looking forward to get it, getting it. Uh, a clamshell, Android clamshell PDA called the Gemini. Now, if you ever use a Scion, which I did, I loved back in the 90s. I loved my Scion. It's about the size of an eyeglasses case. And you'd open it up, and it would have a kind of wide screen, not color in those days. It's color now in this new device. And it had a fairly decent keyboard with almost real full-size keys. So Gemini, which is a phone from a United Kingdom company called Planet Computers, is they're making this now not in your budget of 300 bucks. Uh, I'm pretty sure they did a crowdfunding on this because I, th I think $599 for the uh, LTE model. Although that's a good price considering that, you know, the new Samsung S9 is, what was it, seven. 720, 740 they're starting at. So um, I think that's going to be pretty good. They have an LTE model. If you want to save a little money, you can get a Wi-Fi only model for $499. It's got a 64 gigs of storage. And you can uh, and you can use it as a phone as well as a kind of a portable computer. I look forward to... Uh, I, I can't remember. You have to see where I ordered that. <laughs> I've made a pledge to myself. I'm not going to buy any more Kickstarter or Indiegogo projects because I've been burned and disappointed so many times. I finally got my uh, LED light-up eyelashes. Yeah, I paid a lot for those, and it turned out it took almost a year to get them. Yeah, no, I did buy those. It took almost a year to get them, and I'll show you sometime. And... Uh, <laughs> And like within a month of me buying this thing on Kickstarter, there were a hundred companies ripping them off on Amazon for a quarter of the price. So it wasn't a good choice. I made a bad choice. I got to live with it. I'll see if I can find this uh, Gemini. Um, it's an interesting idea. I would love to see the, you know, like the handheld portable computer come back. 8888 Ask Leo. More of your calls right after this. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. No news on Toots the Unicorn. The Kickstarter I funded that, or was it an Indiegogo? I think it was an Indiegogo that, a unicorn that farts rainbows. No, no, haven't gotten that yet. I think that one died. Where did I buy the Gemini? I'm pretty sure I did buy that one. Because I, I was such a fan of the uh, Scion. Yeah, Indiegogo. There it is. Yep. He's been everywhere, my friend Johnny Jet Travels the world, helping us travel better through technology. Joins us every week. He's at the airport right now. But this is a perfect example of a man who can use technology. I'm seeing a picture of Johnny Jet. What and 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 he's. Are you going to Winnemucca, Mac? Where are you going? Where are you going? <laughs> well, I, I'm, in, I'm in the Miami airport. You can probably hear the overhead announcement right now. I can, but you still sound great. You must be. What are you? Are you? What? what are you connected to Ethernet? How are you doing this? I'm on my Aspire Acer Aspire S7, and I'm. Wow. I literally just cruised through security, and I logged on my computer. You're on Wi-Fi, airport Wi-Fi. Airport Wi-Fi. One minute before you called, and I'm amazing. And I. And I wasn't sure I was going to have to call in and say I might be a little bit late today, but I was able to cruise through security. Johnny, you rock. In traffic. Look and at now this guy. I'm here. Look at this guy. I was speaking at a conference in Fort Lauderdale, the biggest cruise conference called Sea Trade. So and let me I ask you because we, we had a caller. She's going on a Princess cruise to Alaska, which is a wonderful trip, yes. uh, but she's worried about bandwidth. And you and I have talked before about Royal Caribbean, which has this amazing Vroom bandwidth right. that is that is unparalleled. Are other cruise ships going to start doing this? Are they talking about that? That is a good question, and I, you know, I should have walked the floor a little bit more ask to find him. that answer. Ask him, will you? Because right I've done now, I've Princess Cruises before. I actually did Twitter. Actually, Princess Cruise about eight years ago had the first Twitter ever cruise, and I was <laughs> part of that. You wouldn't want to go on a, a Twitter cruise these days. 
No. <laughs> you, you'd be joined by all the nuts in the world uh, <laughs> and a bunch of Russian bots. Hello. My name is Kerry. I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana. <laughs> Good to meet you. Zdrasvity. Uh So, uh, well, ask next time because I'm curious if any of the – because the, the, obviously technology exists. RCI has it. Oh, yeah. And, and everyone realizes that everyone wants to be connected. So Everybody, I'm, sure they're, I'm, yeah. I'm sure they're going that route. And they don't want to pay a lot of money. And so that's – the well, cruise lines realize that you know, if they want to get these people – you, that, you pay a lot uh, for they, this. They be connected. You pay a lot for this room service from RCI. I think it was uh, sixty dollars. But like a the day. river cruises don't charge a penny. But the, but they're but the, uh, the, they're in land. But, they're in the middle right. of a country where, you, where you're out in the ocean. You've got to use a satellite. Exactly. And that can be expensive. They do this. They have dedicated satellites aiming at the ship. So it's really, I'm sure, expensive for them. And maybe they can, it makes sense for them because they have such big ships with five thousand passengers. But uh, right. I, you know, I just it would be wonderful to be able to be. Well, frankly, I want to do my shows from the ocean. I want <laughs> twenty. Yeah, you'd be living. Wouldn't it be cool if I could do the radio year. show on a cruise ship? I would love it, and I, I, I and I'd like to be a guest. You would be my my guest every week. Okay. <laughs> you I could just, be your sidekick. My I could sidekick. Be your, I could be. I could be Ed McMahon. Yeah. So so all right. So tell me about uh, some. Every week you join us with a great app. Uh, yep. and, a, and a great website. Tell me some of those. All right. So my app this week, you know, I, I came down to Florida and yesterday my sister called me up last minute and said, do you want to play golf? I'm like, uh, yeah, I haven't played golf in years. So anyway, I played golf and then I discovered this Golf Now app. Ooh. It's called Golf Now and it's free for Android and iOS. Yeah. And what? And if I did play golf often or even if I, you know, when I traveled, I would use it because I would at least try it out I, and I haven't used it yet. Because they give you the best tee rate time rates at over 6,000 golf courses in the U.S. and internationally around the world. This kind of makes sense. And, so there's like open table for restaurants, which all the restaurants love because it brings them new business. This is like open table for golf yeah. courses. And you don't need to call the golf course. You can make your reservation makes sense. You know, through, through yeah. the app. So you don't have to spend sense. the time you know, on hold. And um, and also what they say they do is they'll tell you – they'll even I think it's I think it's a premium version, this part. They'll help you choose which golf cart. The golf club is the right one. They have an the Apple thing. Watch app that will say, okay, you're on it. It's 543 yards, a par five. We'd recommend you pick the nine iron. Pick yeah. the nine iron. <laughs> and Laporte picks the nine iron, and he's on the green. <laughs> no, I don't think they do it in a golf voice, but they do have an Apple Watch app, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> Yeah, and that's cool. And yeah. you know, someone I, I did read one of the comments saying they only use the courses that really need help, that that they're you know are hurting for business. So I don't know if you're going to get Pebble Beach or anything like that. You know what? There's some great Muni courses. <clears throat> I'm not a golfer, but I'm told there's some great municipal courses. There's lots of courses that are un, under attended, that have l much lower costs, that you can have a lot of fun on. Yeah, and, and this is supposedly will save you up to eighty percent on certain courses. So yeah. listen, anything yeah. that saves you up to eighty percent. Even 20% is worth at least checking out. Golf Now. You can go to golfnow.com to get the app. And I almost hit a hole in one yesterday, by the way. It was my first time playing golf what? in years, but I was just feeling it. You should. And you should get a hole in one. You'd be, we'd have to call you I put Johnny it on my Facebook Putter. page so you can see that. Oh, good. Okay. Johnny Jet. All right. On, uh, Facebook. And I got a website for you. We still got time? Yep. All right. So this one, you know, how many times have you had your friends or colleagues saying, hey, you want to meet halfway somewhere? And you're like, where should we go? I have it ha happen to me all the, uh, all the time. So this website's called whatshalfway.com. Now, John says you should be Johnny T-Shot. Okay. Johnny T-Shot. What's halfway? <laughs> whatshalfway.com. So you put in your two starting points. You can use address, zip codes, cities, and it's not limited to the U.S. It's international. And you can then select the type of venue, accommodations, food or drink, or if you want to meet at a oh. restaurant or a bar. It's, it's like that, uh, that, that song, that old song, country song, Meet in the Middle. You can meet, meet in the middle. In the middle. Oh, and it's, that's so cool. That is so a silly it, thing, but what you know what? It if is, you, it's good. If it's great it, for travelers. I'll meet you halfway. Wow. So halfway between Miami and where I am right now, which is Petaluma, California. Oh, it's going to be like Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Let's see. What kind of venue? Accommodation, food or drink, nightlife, fun and family, <laughs> cultural <laughs> shopping. Let's have some. Let's have lunch. Let's see I'm, what's I'm halfway. I'm ready. I'm hungry. Let's see what's halfway. It is uh, Texas. Well, I was just there. 
Look at that. Okay. I, Ozona, Texas is exactly halfway. Halfway, but you but, can you can change the range. So, you, but you would most likely use it for like between Petaluma and San Francisco. Some right, and then they will sell, they'll tell you to meet in Tiburon or wherever right. or or right. Mill Valley. I know where we're gonna meet. What is that beautiful hotel overlooking the bay? In Sausalito. Oh, Sausalito. Yes, yes. Caballo Point. Caballo. My favorite hotel. Let's make that. Let's meet there for lunch. Caballo uh, Point Hotel. Murray, How about Murray that? Circles of restaurant. Yeah, it's a great. <laughs> uh, definitely. I think we did that actually one time. <laughs> we did. We had dinner at Mur Murray Circle. Uh, yeah, well, that was good. So this is this is called. I love this idea. This just shows you there's no uh, idea that you can have that doesn't have a home on the internet. Meethalfway.com. They should have called it Meet in the Middle, but then they would think it was about hamburgers or something, right? <laughs> Meethalfway.com. Johnny Jet, you won't tell us where you're going. I can't tell you where I'm going, but I'm excited. I'm getting on a big you, bird, a 777-200. You can't or you won't? Um, I can, but I won't. Yes, you, you won't. Let's be honest. Yeah. No one's yeah, yeah, stopping you, Johnny, but it is a fun <laughs> game. Where the heck... Is Johnny Jet yeah, going? If, if they follow me on Instagram or Twitter, then they'll know. I put little clues. I say, guess the airport. I don't want to, you know, spoil it. Well, we know now. We've got a, a head start because we know you're in Miami. That's so, true. A triple seven from Miami. And how long will you be uh, in transit for? I will. I will. I won't land for another eight or nine hours. Okay. Okay. I got a pretty good idea then. <laughs> I, I, you're not going to the Faroe Islands. I can tell you that. No, right I'm, not, now. I'm no. definitely not going there. I'm... <laughs> Johnny but Jed, his website. I got a tip for you, by the oh, way. Oh yeah, go ahead. Quick yeah, yeah, so yeah, when you're that. in the Miami, Miami airport, there's a couple. If you, you know, there's a couple good lounges. It's a Centurion Lounge here. Yeah. So if you have an American Express Platinum card or higher, you can get in for free. Otherwise. Oh. You can get in if you have a regular American Express card. Even the green one will cost you fifty dollars. It's worth it though for but a nice they have lounge. Food, if you've got a big but layover, lounge is used, but that lounge is usually packed. So just go for the food, and then if you go, if you have status with American Airlines or have access to their lounge, then you go there and you do your work. Which you I'm can't to bring do. in food from the Centurion Lounge. No, to the... you can't. You eat at the Centurion Lounge. Oh, okay. I'll eat, I'll eat the bar standing up, and then go I'll to, go to the American go to his lounge. website for tips like this. JohnnyJet.com. He'll scrounge anything anywhere. Thank you, Johnny. <laughs> Follow him on Thank Twitter you. and Instagram. We'll see you next time. Leo Lapointe, Big Tech Guy. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. I love it. Scrounge the meal at the Centurion and oh, then go over I'm, to the American Airlines. Yeah, I'm hungry right now. Yeah. So nine hours. Have a great trip. And will you be here next week? I will be. I think I'll be in L.A. Okay. You're amazing. Leo Laporte. The tech guy, 8888, ask Leo. The phone number, if you want to talk high tech, I'd love to talk to you right now. We got Bruce on the line from Anaheim, California. Hello, Bruce. Hello, Leo. Welcome. What can I do for you? Well, I recently moved into a retirement home, and uh, there are a lot of people around here that are not very tech uh, savvy. Are you going to be their uh, te their tech uh, go to tech guy in the uh, in the home? I bet you well, are. Well, I hope not. Oh. <laughs> but I will for a few people. <laughs> Don't tell them you know anything then. <laughs> I, the, the people here are all in their 80s, mostly. Uh -huh. And I've got three women in particular that I'm trying to find a computer for. My wife and two other women, and I'm uh, willing to hold classes for the three oh, women. isn't that great? And, Good for you. That's and great. I, and I would like to buy computers that are all the same so that we don't have different computers i would buy one first for my wife good and get it get it configured and see how it really operates and then i would have the other two women buy their computers and i would configure them for them and then i would hold classes for the three women and uh, uh i was looking at chromebooks we oh great idea wife. Great idea. We we have our own Wi-Fi system here. Okay. Uh, and I think mostly all they're going to be doing is surfing the web yep. and doing email. And I don't need a very powerful computer. Did you, uh, did, have you, uh, are they going to be using an email system uh, that you'll set up for them? Or does some of them have existing email? 
Well, essentially, none of them have existing email okay. at the time. They've, so the Chromebook will emails. work. Chromebook will work with any web-based email system, but of course, uh, because it, Chromebooks come from you know Google, it's the Google operating system. Uh, it probably is the easiest to use Google's own mail system, although there are probably easier to use email systems that are f just as free as Google's own mail. Uh, but the key is you need to use one that's web-based because really all a Chromebook is is Google Chrome. Uh, so if it if you can't do it with Chrome, you can't do it <laughs> pretty much. Uh, although I found I use a Chromebook all the time, I can do pretty much anything I want to do, and I would imagine the advantages of a Chromebook might really make this a good choice for you. Uh, for one thing, they're less expensive. Uh, they're very hard to screw up. Uh, you don't have to worry about viruses or hacking in any way, you know. So security becomes uh, almost not, you know, nothing to worry about. It's very secure. Uh, the, you you're going to want to pick depending on their eyesight one with a good screen. Uh, most Chromebook screens tend to be a little bit smaller. You'll want to pick one with a usable keyboard as well. That's an advantage over something like uh, the other device that I might recommend, which is an iPad. Uh, a lot of uh, older people love, my mom loves her iPad. She still uses a MacBook, but but uh, she really loves her iPad because it's so easy to use, so simple. But it, the screen's bigger on a Chromebook. It's less expensive in some cases than an iPad. It's certainly far more uh, capable when it comes to web browsing and uh, things like that. So I think you've got the right I, idea. I think that's a great I idea. Have I have an iPad that I don't use, and I've tried to get my wife to use it, and she doesn't like it because it doesn't have a keyboard. There you go. I have my I have an eye my eye on a Acer fourteen inch Beautiful. screen. It's, yes, it's got about four K uh, or uh, four gig of uh, um, RAM and uh, about sixteen uh, gig of uh, storage. Yep, and I think that should be sufficient. That's complete. Uh, this is I, the one of those nice aluminum ones, I presume. This is a gorgeous, yes. gorgeous laptop. They're going to love it. It's one of the bigger screens. 14 inches is a good size. I don't think anybody will have trouble uh, reading that. And, of course, you can in Chrome make text bigger, so they can make it as big as they need. This is, I highly recommend it. 4 gig is, is pretty common for the RAM on Chromebooks. You don't need more. Uh, I don't recommend less, but you don't need more. And 16 gigs is token storage but that's because of the way a chromebook works you're really not encouraged to save stuff to your chromebook if you have photos you save it to google's photos in the cloud not onto your chromebook uh, if you create documents you tend to use google's docs uh, and theirs are stored in the cloud so chromebooks don't come with a lot of storage because you know although i have to say 16 gigs it's funny that i'm saying that's not a lot of storage you obviously remember bruce the day when a two gig hard drive in a computer was considered wow, <laughs> but we've gotten so used to terabyte hard drives that sixteen gigabytes doesn't seem like so much. It's more than enough for the basic usage, and uh, they'll store everything else in the cloud. I started out with this, uh, at sixteen kilobytes. In yeah, my first computer. yeah, that's the RAM. But yeah, I remember very well buying our first hard drive it was five thousand dollars. It was a whopping five megabytes. You, you, yep. I take pictures that wouldn't fit on that hard drive. One image today wouldn't fit on that hard drive. But that was, you know, in the in the mid '80s, that was a lot of storage. Sixteen's yep. plenty. Four gigs of RAM, sixteen gigs of storage. Uh, those Acer's are gorgeous. I highly recommend them. I believe they will also run Android apps, which is nice. They have touch screens, so they can run the Android apps, which means uh, you're going to be, uh, you know, a wealth of applications available. You know, and you know they're going to want to play probably some card games or some uh, you know Candy Crush things like that, and you will be able to play online uh, and Android games. So I think this is a I could Bruce I couldn't agree with you more. You're on the exact right track for this. Okay, I sure do thank you. And, uh, I, I thank you. I've, you you're going to have yeah. a little uh, a little harem of people here learning how to use computers from you, Bruce. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. I've been watching you since uh, you were on Tech TV, oh, thank you. and I say my my wife bought me my first computer, a pet with sixteen kilobytes of memory. Oh, 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 oh man! You know what's funny? That in computer terms, that feels so primitive and ancient, but it really wasn't that long ago, was it? Really? No, it wasn't. In the scheme of things, uh, Bruce, have a, I think you've gone, you've picked it. You obviously have learned well. 
and you've picked exactly, I think, the right thing that I would tell you to get if you had just called in to ask. That those Acers are beautiful. Their price is right, and uh, and they're they're going to love this uh, because it's going to open the whole world to them. You're talking around three hundred bucks each, so it's really a great choice. Okay, Bruce. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Have fun. 1080p screen. And these are really nice, uh, nice systems. Our website, techguylabs.com, is available for you 24 hours a day at no charge. We put links in there. I will put a link to that Acer Chromebook. I love that. I am uh, looking forward to trying a new Windows machine. The first Windows machine on ARM, I should have it by uh, maybe by next week. HP NVX2, it's called. They're shipping it out, I think, on Friday. So it's a little pricey. It's $1,000. It's running Windows 10 S, although you can upgrade it to Windows 10 Pro. And it has a Qualcomm Snapdragon chip in it, not an Intel chip. But they're because of that, they're claiming 22 hours of battery life, plus an LTE uh, radio that means you could be always on. I'm very intrigued by this as a lightweight portable system. So I'll have a review of that for you, I think, uh, next week, the HP NV X2. They're sold out right now. Obviously, there's some demand or at least some interest even at that high price in a, in a very portable system. More to come. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Stay here. <laughs> and everybody's going, oh, that thing only has 128 gigs of storage. How will you live? Only four gigs of RAM. How can you survive? Well, I don't think it'll be the snappiest thing in the world, but uh, it'll be, uh, I think it might be all right. I think it might be enough. We shall see. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, all that jazz. 8888 Ask Leo, the phone number if you want to talk high tech. 888 827 5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada or Riverside, California. That's where Greg hangs his hat. Hello, Greg. Hi, Leo. I've got a question for you about uh, we have our email server is through one company and we want to move it to Squarespace, which is G Suite. I know it's kind of technical, but I'm That's really okay. scared to do it. <laughs> I don't blame you. So do you have a custom email address, yourcompany.com, something like that? Yeah. And we so our our website, uh, it, our domain is registered through another company, actually DSL Extreme, and then Squarespace hosts our website so it so the way it works right now is dsl extreme your web host web registrar has the dns or does now and we're really getting in technical here or does squarespace do the dns i i would guess that what it is is that uh generally this is how it works the the registrar dsl extreme has the records but it points it to dns servers on squarespace but you could easily so so the I, here's the here's how it works in a nutshell. Um, when you go to a website, the domain name servers say, "Well, that name, your company name dot com, goes to this internet address, one on Squarespace, your hosting company." Uh -huh. Same thing is available for email. It's called an MX record. It says when mail comes to your company name dot com, it should go to this server. So fundamental bottom of this it just near you merely need to tell whoever is doing the do, the the mail redirection my guess is dsl extreme but it might be through squarespace you'll have to figure that out that has to be so, modified to send your mail instead to gmail to google so, so the way it's set up now is it's a it's an old pop three server right so uh who's, and who's that, got the server Oh, uh, I believe it's we log in to get to our webmail to to make changes to our webmail is we go to DSL Extreme's so web. So DSL Ext web. Okay, so this is who's hosting your email right now is DSL Extreme. Okay, yeah. So that yeah. means they have the domain this is as I expect expected. They have the domain name information. They they maintain that information. They have one entry this, what's called the C name that points to Squarespace. So when you come here for a website, www goes to Squarespace, but they haven't changed the MX record. That's still going to DSL Extreme. Okay, and they're the one running a pop server. Doesn't matter what kind of server is running. All that matters is that the MX record in your DNS entry 
your domain name system entry, points to whoever you want to have handle the email. Now, some companies, and in DSL Extreme may do this, I don't know off the top of my head, may charge you a small fee, a few bucks, to forward mail over to Gmail. Or it may simply be a change in your DNS entry at DSL Extreme. Either way, it's instant. So you, so you want to make sure that you've got it all set up on the Gmail side because your mail will st immediately stop going to that DNS, DSL Extreme uh, web server and it'll immediately start going to Gmail. All the mail that's currently on DSL Extreme will remain there. Okay. Because what we're doing is we're forwarding our emails to our Gmail account anyways. Right. That, so I mean, let's so simplify that. <laughs> uh -huh. And by the way, if you have now set up this G Suite, uh, uh -huh. You can have the G Suite mail do the same thing. It can actually go to the DSL Extreme pop server and say, give me the mail, please. I'm going to handle it from here. Okay. So yeah, you don't have you... to change anything. You could actually keep it exactly as it is and just set up your new G Suite to fetch mail from DSL Extreme. In the long run, uh, I think it's best that the mail go direct. It'll be faster if it just goes directly to Gmail. Yeah, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to – so we want to – Squarespace has a pretty easy way to transfer – uh, your domain, we want to transfer our domain registry from DSL Extreme to Squarespace. And I, am, am I wrong to assume the email will move with it? You are not wrong. The email <clears throat> will break, though, immediately. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because, because you will have to, at the same time as you say, okay, Squarespace is going to take over our domain name. Oh, good. Uh -huh. At the same time as you do that, you're going to have to... Uh, Make sure you're, that, that will sever your connection with the DSL Extreme server. Mail will now go immediately to your G Suite, your, your Squarespace settings. And you probably won't have to change anything. Squarespace is set up to do that, so you probably won't have to do anything at all at Squarespace. So in effect, by moving your record from your current registrar to the new registrar, Squarespace, moving it from DSL Extreme to Squarespace, when you move that record... At the same time as you do that, there's a, there's something called <clears throat> time to live or TTL. It takes a little while for that change to propagate, but as it propagates, and and within a day it will be fully propagated. All the emails start going to this new this new spot automatically. Okay, well, it's still kind of scary, but I'm gonna we're gonna try it. it we'll shouldn't. It here's the deal: Squarespace is great this way. Call them; they're gonna help you. They're gonna ha you're going to say to them, look, we're moving our email. It's currently hosted by DSL Extreme. They also have the domain record. We'd like to move the domain record. Most cases, when you're moving registrars, the new registrar will assist you making the move. Okay. And they, and they should handle all the details on that. Okay. Yeah. So actually, don't be afraid. Okay. <laughs> don't be afraid. The good news is because you've been using Gmail all along, your users are going to feel very comfortable. They're going to they'll have a new G Suite address. Yeah, uh, but but uh, I presume that's your company name. Usually, yeah, it'll the domain name will stay the same. Right, it'll right. yeah, it'll. But just, they'll be going now to mail you know, your company name com something like that. Right, right. Yeah. No, I, the Squarespace will be great. That's one of the reasons you move to Squarespace for your hosting, and they are a former sponsor. They're not a current sponsor anymore. But one of the reasons you move to them is because they will facilitate this move. They will help you with this. Okay. So don't be afraid. Okay. I know you're worried your boss is going to say, Smithers, where's my mail? Well, I'm the owner, so. Oh, well, then you have nothing to fear but yourself. <laughs> yeah, I can just ruin everything for myself. <laughs> <laughs> your wife oh no you didn't tell me your wife's involved all right now now you got to worry now you should be afraid yes yeah. because because i have this problem too when when my wife says it's not working then i start to get scared that's why she has the best computer in the office <laughs> yeah of course yes same thing here yeah. uh yeah family-run business yep i know that i know exactly how that works yeah you want to keep your wife happy okay <laughs> i don't think it's gonna be a problem uh, but okay. this is where having Squarespace help you will make a big difference because they do this every day, all day long. It's a very simple thing. Okay, sounds good. Hey, good luck. <laughs> it's so it's really funny because, and I've said this before. Uh, you know, when we first start, started using computers, we didn't have to really know anything about networks and domains and email servers and all that. It was all very simple. Now you got to be a networking expert. Especially if your business is running on this stuff, you have you have to become a, an expert in this stuff. 
That's all right. It's fun. You know what? It's fun. And it's not, and the good news is it's gotten a lot easier. It's not as hard as it used to be. More of your calls still to come. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888 Ask Leo. Website techguylabs.com. Dick D. Bartolo, Mad's Maddest Writer, and our Gizwiz coming up in about half an hour. Stay tuned. <clears throat> Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo, thank you to Michael Cozio, our musical director, for providing this great interstitial music for us. Thanks also to Heather Hammond for answering all the phones, like Scott in Woodland Hills, California. Hi, Scott. Hey, Leo, how are you doing? Wonderful. How are you? I am good, thank you. First time, long time. Good. Welcome. Uh uh, thank you. Hey, I've got, uh, um, I'm trying to cut the cable cord here. Um, the, uh, the way my apartment faces, I can't get satellite, so I'm stuck to this one company and they're gouging me. <sighs> so yeah. So my question is, I want, uh, you know, I want to go, uh, with a router. Um, and I, I don't know which router to really get. I live in a, a small apartment, two bedrooms, one floor. Um, and I need to know a good Wi-Fi speed that I, you know, the uh, so I can stream basically everything to a smart TV, yeah, yeah. Um, iPad. Stuff the like good that. news is because it's a two-bedroom apartment, it shouldn't be too difficult. A single, you don't have to go out and buy the more expensive mesh routers that we talk about all the time, like the Eros or the Orbeez or the Plumes. Those are much more expensive, but they're designed for a lot more real estate. Uh, because people who live in uh, houses have, you know, a big problem with upstairs, downstairs, and, you know, it just it gets to be very difficult. But two-bedroom apartment, a single decent router should be fine. Um, and you're getting internet. What speed internet are you getting? I, I don't know exactly what I have. That's so that's what's going to determine, really. The router isn't going to – is you don't worry about the router. Worry about <laughs> Your original internet speed, the router, any any decent router will pass through the speed pretty close to the full speed. So uh, that's not something you need to worry about. Just hope that you have enough bandwidth from your internet service provider to do all this. So if if um, if I'm streaming, you know, 720, 10, 1080 shows, what speed do you think I should look for? Uh, generally, I would say, you know, Netflix actually has a page where they say what's required uh, for high definition, as long as you don't have two other people in the apartment who are watching at the same time, if you have undivided uh, access to that full speed, 25 megabits is more than enough. Uh, if you want 4K, they often recommend 50 megabits. That's my, you know, my basic rule of thumb. And it really only only more if you've got other people doing other things, taking bandwidth. Remember, it's divided among all the people using it. Right, and I do have a couple sons that do play games. Yeah, on their okay. And they have a, they have a, they're going to have a TV in their room watching things. Yeah, so then now you got to you know include them in the um, in the c calculation. If they're going to be, for instance, watching Netflix while you're trying to watch Netflix, then you're going to double the amount of bandwidth you need. So, so I should I should shoot, I should shoot for fifty. Well. Yeah, I think 50 is reasonable. Um, let me tell you what Netflix says. They're they're lower than I am. They say that uh, if you want standard definition, which you know is probably lower than you want, you need three megabits. They say five megabits is fine for HD and 25 for ultra HD. My experience has been, and maybe that's because you know I have other people using it. Um, if you have 25, you should be fine for HD, even if. Two people are watching. That should be enough for HD. And yeah, what drives me nuts right now is, is the buffering. You know. Yeah, and that's a re that's a result of two things: one, not enough speed, but also inconsistent speed. Who do you get your internet from? Uh, it's Spectrum. Okay, so it's a cable company. You should be fine. Yeah. Generally, cable companies offer more than enough bandwidth for this, and they're pretty consistent. Now, if it's the apartment complex doing it, they may, you know, that may be less consistent. For a variety of reasons, you know, they're splitting it off. They're doing weird hardware things. You got a lot of people using a small amount of bandwidth. So, uh, you know what I would do right now? I would just take your computer and go to uh, speedtest.net on your browser and just see what you're getting. Yeah, I'm honestly, I want to, you know, cut ties with Spectrum totally. So, oh, you um, don't want to even pay them for internet? No, I want to. 
Well, you're going to need somebody to give you your internet, and yeah, you're going to want you're going to want uh, I would say at least 25 megabits. Yeah, I want to package something with like a streaming service, whether that, and I don't know if you have recommendations on like Directv Now or Hulu or. Sling, I use, you know? uh, and it depends where you are, but uh, I think in uh, in the LA area, uh, YouTube is very good. I use TV.YouTube.com, thirty five bucks, it gives you the local stations. Uh, DVRs for up to five people, and you could share it with all or six people. You could share it with your whole family. So, eat your kid would have his own DVR. It includes YouTube Red. I bet you your kid watches a lot of YouTube. Uh, so that's ad free yeah. YouTube for them plus YouTube Music. Uh, I think it's a great deal at thirty five bucks. But yeah, there's PlayStation View, there's Sling TV, there's Direct TV. Now there's a number of services. This is all they're all called over the top services. That is, they use your internet bandwidth to deliver television. Uh, and then if you want pro, you know if you want uh, uh, expensive channels like HBO and Showtime or Hulu, you're going to add that. You're going to add it all up. So you have to include internet access plus one of these services plus whatever premium channels you want to get plus Netflix if you want that because they don't include Netflix, Hulu if you want that because they generally don't include Hulu. So you you want to add it all up. It probably and frankly once you do it probably doesn't save you a lot of money over cable, but it gives you a lot more flexibility. It might save you a little bit. Um, so. so okay, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll, last last thing. Thank you very much. Sure. So you're tell, so you're telling me the router is not that big a deal, but really it's the band. The no, band get a good the router. Band. I would recommend. Uh, I, I I go by a company called the Wire Cutter at thewirecutter.com. They have they test all the routers. They really like the TP Link uh, C7 Archer. Actually, I don't know if that's their current. Let me see what their current recommendation is. I use ASUS ASUS routers, but yeah, you don't have to spend a lot of money on a router. Uh, to get uh, to get more than enough bandwidth, and in a two bedroom apartment, you that probably be more than enough. You don't need to have to worry about getting extra units or anything like that. Well, thank you very much, sir. You're, you're welcome. Let me just check real quickly to see the best wireless router for most people, according to the Wire Cutter. They've changed their recommendation to the Netgear Nighthawk, which is actually very good. Uh, that's a little pricey, though. It's uh, it's almost two hundred bucks, um, so I'm not sure that's. It's funny that they've changed their recommendation from um, what used to be the, the Archer C7 was uh, under a hundred dollars. So I'm not sure if that's because as they've tested, they found that people wanted to wanted better routers. They also like the ASUS RTAC3200, which I've used for years, is an excellent router. Also two hundred bucks. I guess what's changed? Here's the budget pick. They like a Netgear. 6700 that's 90 dollars what has changed is you want to get uh spend more on a router than you think not 40 dollars, not 50 dollars, and you probably want to get a new router every few years because the technology's changed but routers also wear out so uh, i would agree with the wire cutters picks i think all three of these the netgear nighthawk the asus uh, AC3200 and uh, the Netgear R6700, they're all good. I don't know why they stopped recommending TP-Link. I think that TP-Link Archer C7 is the best budget router. And probably more than enough. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls right after this. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure why they stopped recommending the TP-Link. But this is Jim Salter, who's great. We've interviewed him a couple of times on the new screensavers. I trust him completely. So if he if he says it, I believe it. 8888, ask Leo the phone number. Back to the lines we go. Jeff in Granada Hills, California. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Leo. How are you doing? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm great. Though, earlier call, uh -oh. when you Though? talked about... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. You, you talked about how when your wife says something's not working, it's like time to get a fix. Yes. Well, I'm there. I've got a Asus uh, router that's a couple years old. It's a, uh, uh, what is it, an AC1900. Yep. Nice, uh, a nice router, but a couple of years old is maybe the Im important phrase there. Yeah, and even when we first got the router... My son's room is just maybe 30 feet down the hall from uh, where the router is installed, but he's always had trouble with connections. I put in a range extender that sits just outside his room, but he still says he has problems, and my wife also. So I'm looking at 
a mesh router. And I know you've talked about them a million times, but never paid that much attention. Yeah, now that you need one, you want to know, right? Exactly. So the idea of these mesh routers, they're really designed for larger spaces. Each unit, and they typically come with three, although you can get them with as few as one or two, and you can add them onesie, twosie as you want. But generally, people will use three. Each unit covers about 1,500 square feet. Uh, and there, the theory behind them is that, in, that instead of having a single access point where all the bandwidth is coming from, and of course, as you get farther and farther from it, the speed goes down. And if there's walls in between, you might even lose connectivity. You certainly lose bars. Instead of that, you spread the Wi-Fi out throughout the house on these units, these mesh units. They're all equal. That's the thing that makes mesh mesh. Each There isn't a, a base station and extenders. That system, which has been around for a while, is not ideal because in order to do extenders, you actually have to slow down the Wi-Fi by half. The extenders, uh, extenders. My, son, my, my son has told me since I put in the extender, things have been even worse. Slower. Because the extender has to spend half the time talking to the base station, the other half talking to you. It, it can't talk both directions at the same time, so it's half the speed. So a mesh doesn't have that problem. Mesh units typically have their own back channel. Um, they also are more modern, and they usually have some more sophisticated software in them that does things like checks what kinds of devices you're connected to. And based on information they, they, they've they had at the start and learned over time, they may modify the topology of your network so that the TV watching Netflix is going to get better speed than the somebody down the hall who's just doing email. And so the, all of that's useful. They have other additional features that I think are important for security. Uh, I use a system. I use several systems. One of my systems, Plume, all of them are good for guests. They have a guest Wi-Fi, and they have a, usually an automated way of uh, uh, telling the guest what the password is, and you can expire the password. The Plume has three guest, three networks, a main network that has full access, a guest network that has good internet access but also can talk to other machines in the network but a third network which is great for internet of things devices that only allows internet access doesn't allow anybody on that network to see other devices on the network that's a nice security feature many of them like the Eero uh, have adult um, content restrictions that you can turn on all, almost all of them have schedules that you can pause the internet at night you said you have a teenager this is great you can say you know, no internet access after 10... We do this with our teenager after 10 p.m. because otherwise he'll stay up all night. Uh, right. Things like that are very, very handy. You can even on the, the Eros... And I should mention, by the way, Eero is a sponsor of uh, some of my podcasts. On the Eros, you can say to your Amazon Echo, pause the internet. Uh, in fact, you can... This I love this. Most of these will also do this. You can say, uh, assign devices to users. So Michael, our 15-year-old, I can say, you know... The, that's his phone, that's his computer, that's his tablet, that's his TV, and I can say, pause Michael's devices, they all go offline, but I can continue to use my device. So all of these things are, are great. Here's the downside. They typically start around $300. So a good router now is going to cost you around 200 so it's not a huge amount more, but it's but it's a, you know, definitely sticker shock territory. Yeah, it was I, I've, I've heard you talk about it. I've heard the price, and uh, that's been part of the reason I have uh, put off doing it. But Yeah, but uh, now you have to because your wife forward. says, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> fix the Internet, honey. Uh, ever that's since that. I put in the Eros, I don't hear that anymore. So the, you like the Eero brand? Yeah, I love the Eero brand, but each of them has different kind of capabilities. Netgear's Orbi, which apparently you can find at discount uh, right now at one of the uh, big box stores, uh, it is the fastest single unit device. So if you only have one machine that needs a lot of speed, that's a great way to do it. But most homes have many devices. I have something like 40 or 50 devices using my router. And that's where mesh really starts to show its strength. It may not have the fastest single device throughput, but it's smart about distributing what, what Internet access you have to all of the devices. And that really helps. So I like the Euro. There's a system I also use called Plume that's a little weird. Plume, you put one, you plug them into the wall socket and you put one per room. 
So you end up, I have 12 plume units. So you end up, they're cheaper off the top, but you end up spending more probably by putting one in, because they make little pools of Wi-Fi. Like if you think of Wi-Fi as light, you know, you can't really have a, a light in the living room that lights up the whole house. You know, they just don't go around walls. It's not great. You want to put lamps in everywhere people are. And that's how the plume works with little pools of Wi-Fi where people are. Um, that's another good solution. Orbeez the fastest. I've used that, and I really like it. Uh, I'm not as crazy about Google's uh, Wi-Fi solution. I don't consider it one of the better ones. The other thing all of these systems have that is now, I think, absolutely vital is they are updatable over the air. If there's security issues, these companies, because you paid a little more, they're a little bit higher quality, they will fix the security issues automatically over the air. Super important on your Wi-Fi. Everybody's doing mesh now, though. Asus has it. Linksys has it. Um, so you can shop around. You can look at the reviews. My personal favorite is Eero. It, it, it's kind of the most balanced in the sense and that... On, it, the, on, on the Eero, it's pretty easy set up, I think I've heard you say. Yeah, all of them are very easy set up. They have to be. You will have to have a smartphone, Android or iOS. You'll put the app for the devices on your phone. And in almost every case, you use the app to place the other units, the extension units. Uh, it gives you the strength that says it helps. Is yeah, it's not quite. I wish it would. It 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 says after you. You says it says okay. Put it in the next one. You put it in wherever you put it in, and then it'll tell you. Oh, that's too far. <laughs> I wish it would tell you up front, but it tells you. Oh, that's too far. Or that's great. I'm getting an excellent signal. And then you feel confident. You can move on. I, they're very easy to configure. You will be using this the apps though to configure them. Okay. And we've got about 2,500 square feet, single story. And so if one's in the center of the house... Two should be enough. Is, two should be enough. And then, yeah. Uh, the good news is it's easy to add more if you need it. So just get two to begin with. That'll save you some money. That'll be 200 bucks. All right. And then, and then if you need more, you can get more. And then I can put one directly in my son's room and... And he'll never complain again. Have an issue. Yeah. Is he gaming? I'll never see him again. Yeah. He's gaming. He's yeah. doing a lot of his schoolwork. Uh, in, oh, that's on good. His, uh, okay. Computer and, and YouTube. Uh, he's just having yeah tons of YouTube. He's just having trouble getting uh, connected. Uh, yeah, yeah. He'll thank you. And the one and you will be happy. You and your wife will be happy that they uh, Eero has very good parental controls. Awesome. In fact, I uh, use the Eero uh, yes. safety controls around the whole house to prevent malware. Uh, so I so nobody can download malware. Um, uh, you can control adult gambling, violence. You can, it really, it's it's really a nice system. Highly recommended. Oh, cool! Sounds great. All right, let us know uh, how you like it. Actually, I, I recommend it all the time, and I don't always hear back from people. Let me know if you hate it too. <laughs> eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Dick D. Bartolo's coming up. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Is this Debbie Harry? What is this, Dick no, Bartolo? Oh, it's the Gizwiz. Oh, that's the Gizwiz. I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was uh, Blondie, but no, it's Baldy. It's Baldy. It's close. It's close. <laughs> Dick D. Bartolo is Mad's maddest writer, and he's also, I'm proud to say, our Gizmo Wizard or Gizwiz joins us each and every week to talk about a crazy gadget or Gizmo that he has discovered as he travels about his domain in Gizneyland. Yes, 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 yes. Did you so get actually, snow? Were you snowed in? You know what? The city escaped with two and a half inches. It was going to be like two feet. Yeah. Uh, in Jersey, one town got uh, 30 inches. So wow. it was very, wow. but it was very windy. A lot of branches fell and broke some stuff in the yard, but nothing to shovel. You got so the bomb cyclone without the snow. Exactly. Good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the thunder snow was amazing. It was <laughs> scary. They, yeah. it, the weather is so weird these days. We're making up new names for it. Yes. Yes. The thunder snow. <laughs> Watch out for the thunder snow. Oh, you don't want the bomb cyclone. So what uh, do you got for us, Dickie D? Well, so uh, a fan sent in a video about this and I thought, this is so stupid. And then I go, <laughs> well, wait, it's it's under twenty dollars. I think I should buy one and see how stupid it is. And, it and Yesterday, yes. uh, it came in very handy. So, oh. so all right. So, finding the mute button on remote control 
is pretty hard, especially if you're like over 50 <laughs> and there are 90 buttons there. And the worst part is when the phone rings or someone yells from yeah. another room, you, you get the remote and then you figure which one of these pretty 50 much, buttons. If you're yeah. hitting the remote's mute button, it's a panic mode. There's a yes. reason you need it and you need it fast. Yes. Sometimes so, the TV's turned up too loud or whatever. Yeah. They, yeah exactly. So, so uh, this company this has designed button? only a mute button that Oh, look is, at that. Uh, no, it's it's about two and a half inches across. <laughs> it's okay. like one of those staples that was easy buttons, except yes, it says that, shut the up, shut the yes, bleep up. E exactly. And and so you have to uh you have to program it, right? Teach, yeah. But Leo, it took ten seconds. Basically, you hold your remote control up, the back of this oh, button. I'm buying is, this. <laughs> you, you click it over to learn. You you click mute on your remote control. This button blanks twice usually like in four seconds. And the one thing to remember is once it blinks twice, quickly click it to use, and then it's programmed. And because you only have to I, do that the first time, just to program. The first time. Yeah. And you know what? I, I tried on a bunch of TV sets just to see how oh, easy it is. I'm getting this. This is awesome. <laughs> This so is awesome. I, I set this up just yesterday and I have the TV on. I'm walking around. I, I have this laying on the table. The phone rings and I go, oh, and I look at the at the caller ID and it says Warner Brothers. I go, I need oh, to take it. Yes. Bang! Finally, my movie deal's coming through. <laughs> exactly. Bang. It muted the TV. Actually, it was the new executive edi editor, Bill Morrison of MAD. Um, and it was great. So I was able to talk to him with nothing in the oh, background. Oh, I love yeah. this. So this thing is really great fun. And also, it's much easier to find than your remote control. <laughs> <laughs> because it's giant. It's giant. It's red. Uh, it has non-skid little feet on the bottom. Oh, I love this. Uh, so this is really a neat little guy to keep uh, near your uh, nightstand. It's if twenty bucks, to. right? It's yeah, nineteen fifty. I bought it uh, like Monday, and I checked just before the show. It's nineteen dollars and fifty cents, free shipping if you're a and Prime member. Who who wouldn't want to have a giant red button on their coffee table that says "Shut the bleep up"? Yeah, exactly. Even, even, <laughs> even if it didn't yeah. do anything, you'd want. Yeah, that. you know, your uncle comes in and he's rambling on. You don't say anything. You just put this down on the coffee table. <laughs> And then he thinks, wait a minute, what does that do? Maybe wow. Wow. maybe I'll cut this conversation wow. short. The shut the bleep up button. Or the smash, smash mute. mute. Yes, and if exactly. you want to find it, Dick has uh, the Amazon link and all the information at his website. That's G-I-Z-W-I-Z -I -Z dot B-I-Z. Uh, and uh, while you're there, you can play the What the Heck Is It contest. Brand new contest started at the beginning of the month. It looks like a fingernail peeling, but obviously it's not. Well, I can't even say yes or no to you that. Can't. It could be. The point is, you can get an autographed copy of Mad Magazine, whether you know what it is or not. If you just come up with a good, clever idea, uh, Giz Wiz G I Z W I Z dot B I Z, and uh, don't forget Dick's great show, which is Giz Wiz TV at Giz Wiz dot TV. He does with Chad Johnson great gizmos and gadgets, just like that. Shut the bleep up button. Yeah, <laughs> Smash exactly. mute. Smash well, mute. I'm, I'm going to order one for every TV in the house. That is so useful. It's that great. Be a fun project. I bet you could, uh, I bet you for like $100, <laughs> you could build your own. <laughs> you know, you probably could. And about about three years of aggravation. <laughs> yeah, Raspberry Pi and IR emitter. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. A little programming. And, and, uh, yeah. and, then, you, and then you say, uh, how'd that project go? And you said, I, I threw it out and I spent 1950 yeah. and I bought yeah. Put that big mute button on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dickie D. We'll see you okay, next buddy, week. Okay, buddy. I'll see you next Take week. Take care. Okay, bye. Oh, I Take love care. it. He always comes up with the best stuff that you would maybe never even see in real life. Sh Smash mute. It's on Amazon. Last call of the day, I'm sorry to say, but it's John in Montana. I'm happy about that. Hi, John. Hello. Good afternoon. I appreciate your time. I am interested in a laptop, and I'm wondering what your top two recommendations would be for a reliable uh, instrument, uh, one that would accept DVDs, uh, and sometimes I have a hard time seeing, but something with a large screen, 17-inch or 15.6 screen. Um, 
I am well. I mean, I there are some that still have internal DVD drives. Not a whole lot that's really gone by the wayside as physical media has disappeared and screen sizes on laptops. Very few laptop companies still sell 17s because they're so big. Apple stopped. Uh, Dell still does. Lenovo still does. Those are my two favorite PC manufacturers, as well as HP now, which is kind of a change for me. I used to really think very little of HP computers, but they've gotten better. What I would look at, though, I wouldn't say I have to have a laptop with a DVD player and a big screen, because you, you sacrifice portability, you sacrifice battery life, and, and, and maybe what you want is a laptop that is portable, has better battery life, but an external DVD drive, you don't have to carry it around but you can plug it in via the usb port they're 50 bucks they're not expensive and when you need it you've got it but it, but you don't always have to have it with you and i think if you really need a big screen for low eyesight uh 17 even is that that much get an external uh, monitor so in other words carry the laptop around you can have a 15 inch screen and no dvd player for lightweight and better battery life and when you get home dock it have a full-size keyboard, mouse, monitor, 27-inch monitor, and DVD player. That way you get the best of both worlds. That's that's kind of how I would go. But if you if you really need that, Lenovo still sells 17s with DVD players. So does Dell. They're my top two. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great Geek Week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.